to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Madam. Uh, Madam Clerk, first item, please. Roll call, Your Honor. Sit Council Members Baker? Here. Galloway? Here. Lennon? Piana? Mayor Covey? Here as well. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, Councilman Lennon uh, is driving back from Cincinnati today, and Councilwoman Piana is uh, feeling very under the weather. So we may not have both of them here tonight. Okay. Madam Clerk, next item. Approval of the agenda. Are there any requests for changes to the agenda? If not, a motion to adopt. So moved. Support. Motion made and seconded. Uh, Baker Galloway to uh, approve the agenda as presented. Discussion? Madam Clerk? Council Members Baker? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Mayor Covey? Yes, as well. Madam Clerk, next item, please. First item is a presentation by the Downtown Development Authority. Great. I'm sorry. Thank you. I apologize. One moment, please. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. We have extra seats up front. If anyone in the back would like to sit down, don't be shy. Feel free to come on up. Good evening, Council, City Manager, well-packed audience, and everybody watching at home. I'm from the Ferndale DDA. My name is Chris Hughes. I'm the Communication and Marketing Manager, and I am here tonight with a, another interesting story about downtown Ferndale. It starts with Preserve America, which we have been working on for about two years now, more than two years. We got a grant from the Department of Interior, the National Park Service, and it was awarded to the DDA with the intention of preserving America, or in this case, preserving a piece of, uh, of it called Ferndale, uh, and to provide directional signage to get, key user, get our users to key locations, historical and otherwise. It has been a very interesting and careful process uh, involving many people and important key players. Uh, the Ferndale Historical Society, the city manager, the DPW, um, Councilwoman Baker was at several of our meetings. The group met regularly to discuss and determine the components of our past and take an inventory of our current assets to determine what kinds of things we were going to be sharing and what kind of signage that we could build for now and for the future. As part of the project, the DDA contact, contracted um, through a bid process with the Lakota Group uh, to come out with a timed plan and designs that would be uh, would do the job. In 2000, December of 2008, they came back with some concepts. Uh, this one, traditional in name and design, is kind of typical, not too much terribly spectacular about it. This one, big and kind of corporate, maybe a little too corporate. This one, a fiddlehead, definitely funky, maybe fabulous, and except for being named after a fern, um, just basically no real ties, emotional or otherwise, to connect it to Ferndale. And finally, this one. And this one was the one that struck a chord. It rang a bell, jogged a memory, and it's called Radio City. I wonder why. Uh, went back to history, and it had some fondly obvious reasons that made it a popular hit among the committee and also among the people that were invited, not invited, everybody was invited to come and take a look at all those different concepts as they hung on the wall and voted on them and took a look at them and, and talked about them and felt their way through it, and Radio City came out the winner. So we went from there to this. In January, the Lakota group came back to town and brought with, us, brought with them a mock-up of what it might look like out on the street. And so we did what we do and like to do in downtown Ferndale, and we took it to the streets. And this is our committee out there. That's uh, Jeff White, Roger Schmidt, Christina Shepard Decius, members of the uh, Lakota group, to decide does it or does it not look good. 
we posted it on Facebook because, you know, we don't want to be our own judge. And uh, we got some interesting comments. Pretty groovy. Looks nice. Looks good. Cool concept. Our suburban neighbors will appreciate this. Rainbow colors cost more but would be nicer. <laughs> Love how the design draws from Ferndale's past. And we even documented a couple lukewarm ones, this one in particular. It's not horrible. <laughs> Which, you know, could have been. So we went even further, and we took it to another public forum, and we invited all kinds of people to come, and even the mayor was there. And uh, everyone was invited to join in the process. Teams formed, and they critiqued, and they decided what color, what typeface, what should it look like, what, what looks good, what doesn't look good. They worked together, and they presented their ideas, and they presented it to the group, and they shared it with the design team that was creating these. And so now it went back to the drawing boards, and um, which is kind of where it's been for a while, until this. And I went there today. We were at ASI Tro uh, Sign Company in Troy. These signs are very close to being ready to put in the ground. Uh, they are. This is pieces of them right now. That's the base. Uh, nice, thick, heavy-duty. Uh, metal and I'll, on the left are the stockpile of all the different components that are going to go together. Those on the left, that's all the some of the LED lights, which are as green as you can get, assured me Phil Miller, who is the gentleman holding those two little Ferndale signs right there. Um, the LEDs will be in place next week sometime in those signs as we get there. They're going to get painted in this state-of-the-art automotive grade tunnel. I just wanted to share that because it was kind of cool. And uh, I know it's not very exciting, but that paint chip on the right is the silver. Now, it, we will have our own Ferndalian green, so that wasn't ready yet to share, but that will be what covers those signs. And if you remember this, then this is quite where we're getting to. That is the actual sign. It hasn't been painted yet, but it's going to be out on the street by the end of the month that um, rectangle in the center will be filled with information, it, whether it's a, a directional kiosk or a historical kiosk. Those LED lights will be in place. It's easy to maintain. It's awesome. I mean, I never really thought I would get excited about signs, but that was a pretty exciting thing to see. So they're made to last. We've got five kiosks going in, two directional ones, one on East 9 at the pedestrian alley, the other on West 9 at the north side pedestrian alley. Those will have maps, business listings, and historical elements. And I want to tell you that there are downtowns all over the country that wish they had kiosks like this. We are so fortunate to have this. Um, there will also be three historical kiosks going in. One is the Ferndale State Bank, which looks nothing like a bank anymore. It now lives in the form of Club 9. It was the second bank that was opened in Ferndale. Another one is about the five and dime uh, story in downtown Ferndale, Neisner's, Woolworths, and S.S. Kresge. And another one of the M. Evangelical Association, which became the Tabernacle, which then became Jeffrey's Baptist over on uh, East 9. Uh, in addition, we will be having 25 signs around downtown directing our visitors to parking, parks, schools, city offices, getting them where they want to be as efficiently as possible. So that almost concludes over a two-year project that has been very well um, embraced by everybody in the community, players deciding what it's going to look like. We have put together a, a sign program, the DDA, and the people that were the players that will be good for now. And according to ASI, I, as long as we don't change the layout of Ferndale, well into the future, so we can't move forward or anything. But other than that, it's going to look good for years to come. And one more thing I have to say tonight is that this Wednesday morning from 9 to 10 a.m., we are going to have a networking meeting for all of our downtown businesses and friends at Salon Ray on East 9, and you're all invited, and it's totally free. And that's it from the DDA. Thank you very much. Nice job. Thank you kindly. Very nice job. Another, another great thing for our downtown. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Beautification Award, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, this is a fun time of the year. Peggy Snow is going to come up. I will assist her um, to present the Beautification Awards for this year.
so I'm not sure if they're in order. Or well, you know, I'm not sure. I'm so careful. I went over all my notes before I came, but then I saw just as I was walking up, I wasn't in order either. So anyway, uh, uh, we just give out the awards all at one meeting now. We used to give them monthly, but we decided that once a year was sufficient. And so um, I will start with the June meeting, or the June awards, actually. And the commercial goes to Craig Martin Sports and Event Management um, at 960 <laughs> um, This is the building that used to be Roy's Radio for so many years. I know we had many TVs repaired there. And uh, it, 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 in those years, it was just an average-looking brick building, but uh, he's fixed it up very nicely with uh, beautiful shrubs and uh, nice lawn and flowers. Congratulations. Thank you. And the residential for July or June is uh, at 720 Leroy, Deidre, Padilla. I'm not sure if they're here. This house, it looks like a cottage. It's so pretty and cute. And uh, it just has, I think it has like one of everything there. And it has a little picket fence across in the uh, area between the sidewalk and the street. But it's not white. It's purple. It really stands out. It matches the trim on the house. It's just lovely. Thank you. And the next residential is uh, Nathalie Nunley at 455 East Saratoga, and I don't think she's here. I know she has a, a sick child at home, so um, we'll see that she gets her award. She has a lovely yard. It's, it's, a, it's a cute little house, and she's got the front done nicely, and the whole backyard is uh, between uh, her flowers and things for her children with, with shrubs growing together for the kids to have little hideouts and things. It's very nice. As I say, I got a little disorganized. Um, and these are the July awards. And the commercial one is for the Northeast Service Garage at Woodward Heights and Hilton. And I know they're here. Um, this was nominated by a neighbor. And the neighbor said the corner looks very nice with, with the flower beds. And, um, I received more comments about this award than any award I've given in all these years. Um, people, I had one person call me to the house. I've had people speak to me at the council meeting about it and say how happy they were that they had gotten it and what a beautiful job. And I, I kept trying to go over and take a picture, but she was always out putting more flowers in. It was very <laughs> difficult. So, <laughs> but it looks great. That really fixed up the corner. Now. And uh, the next residential is Christine Walbridge at 2026 Martin Road. And uh, she has a lovely front yard, but when you go there, the front yard is the tip of the iceberg. The backyard is just spectacular. So uh, she was nominated by actually by a city employee. And I, I don't think she's here, so... And the last one for July is Brian McNamara at 1528 West Hazelhurst. And I didn't see him either. Uh, anyway, he, he's only lived in the house since I believe it was February. And you just couldn't believe all that he's done in this house. He said it had like a couple of little irises growing around the side. And he's got a, a flower bed all across the front. And on one whole side, these are raised flower beds. One whole side has vegetables. And then uh, along the driveway, it's all flowers. His backyard is, I couldn't believe all that he's done since just February. Hey, Peggy, Brian also has been for two years managing the uh, garden sales at Western Market. So that gives you an idea of his. Mm -hmm. Let's give Brian a round of applause. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. And the August awards, the commercial one, is for Sam's Ferndale Grill. That's down on Woodward, down towards 8 Mile. Oh, I'm glad someone's here. Yes, very nice. The 
restaurant burned down four years ago, from what the uh, manager told me, and um, they've put up a beautiful brick building with awnings and, uh, and, and flower beds out front. It's a very attractive building. The food's great. And the food is very good, too. Yes, I have been there. And the uh, uh, residential is Savasta Longus. I may not have pronounced her name. Thank you. <laughs> she lives at 348 East Woodland. It's kind of a neighbor of mine on the next block. <laughs> and uh, it's a very attractive, neat little attractive a uh, brick house with beautiful flowers out front, and of course the area between the sidewalk and street, and street is filled in also. Very nice. Thank you, Madam. Very nice. Uh, thank you. And the other residential is um, Maggie Patton at 169 East Camborne. Uh, she called me this morning that she has a broken leg, so she was unable to attend. So, uh, but she has a lovely yard too. Uh, most of it's all in the back. Luckily, we know her next door neighbor, so we're able to see the uh, what she had back there. Sometimes, when it's all in the backyard, it's, we don't realize it. Uh, sometimes the front is very plain, but uh, she was well deserving of the award. And let's see, like this. <laughs> now, due to a mix-up. In the selection process, I did not speak to the people who won the September awards. Uh, Dina Cachadorian, our, one of our members, uh, went around and spoke with them. So I'm just going to, she wrote a little synopsis for each one. And uh, the, the commercial is Rouge. Uh, yeah. And, um, <laughs> Woodward. And, uh, and it was nominated by a neighbor on Breckenridge. And uh, it used to be a, a kind of a plain-looking insurance agency, and they've really dressed it up. And uh, Dina says, in addition to the spa-like atmosphere and natural products, they sell like, uh, jewelry by a Ferndale resident. And um, uh, Whitbecks owns the building and donated a park bench out front, and the neighbors helped with the lovely potted flowers. Thank you. <laughs> and... Um, the uh, com residential, oh, this was the rental residential, was Noel Marie Boudet, I don't know if they're here, 470 East Drayton, and um, Dina said she was nominated by a neighbor who wrote, uh, even though fighting an illness for the last nine months, he turned the corner of a Bermuda and Drayton from weeds and sand, from an overgrown weed and sand corner to something everyone stops and look, looks at. Uh, and uh, he was very appreciative of uh, getting the award. <laughs> and this is a residential. Um, Deborah Johnson, 1687 West Hazelhurst. Now, we didn't know this, but, you know, but when uh, Dina went and spoke to them, uh, her son is... Um, uh, Trevor Johnson, and he was going to be here to pick it up for her, but apparently he didn't. <laughs> he's so, he's yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know how that goes when we moms ask our sons to do things. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> He'll get a kick out of that. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> but anyway, she did. A, I'm sure with direction from her son, she did a lot of the planting in the front, and it does look. She's got the whole front yard with a lot of. Uh, uh, open areas and uh, um, shrubs and, and the mixed in with the flowers. It looks very nice. And the left. Howard Tracy at 620 West Breckenridge. Oh, how nice. Um, Dina had seen them out working in their front yard, and um, 
They decided to go uh, natural with their landscaping and designed the front yard minus grass and has set a stunning example for the neighborhood. She's a mother of, oh, I'm reading the wrong one, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was so careful before I came, but I did get, I had my papers mixed up a little bit. I'm sorry, I apologize. Okay. This is, I, I was correct. She did see him working in the yard while walking home from the market. <laughs> and, uh, and she commented on how nice the house looked and, and the garden looked. Um, he was restoring an eyesore on the corner of West Breckenridge and Livernoise and added to the beauty of his block, which won the block award for 2000 and t or 20, 2020. Ten. Now I'm so nervous. Now I'm gonna. Uh, he has redone the house inside and out, and it it does look great. Thank you. And that's all for this year. We'll be back in January with Holiday Light Awards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before we get to the public hearing, I do want to recognize a special guest in the audience, um, the former mayor of the city of Ferndale, who actually is credited with the beginning of the rejuvenation and the renovation of our city uh, back in the mid-1990s, uh, former mayor Chuck Geddert, who is now the 43rd District Court Judge from Hazel Park. Welcome. Thank you. I did want to just stop by and introduce myself uh, as the new 43rd District Court Judge. I, I very much appreciate that introduction, Mayor. Uh, but in addition to that, and as many folks will know, the 43rd District is a, a three-city state district court that comprises of Ferndale, Madison Heights, and Hazel Park. And in June, the Honorable Robert Turner retired after serving many honorable and dignified years on the bench, and he served in the Madison Heights uh, bench. He retired and that created the vacancy. Judge Hunt has served many years in Hazel Park. He moved over to the, the Madison Heights bench and I have now started my new job earlier this month as the 43rd District Court Judge in Hazel Park. Everybody is welcome to come by sometime, but hopefully not, not before me. I wanted to invite the mayor and council as my special guests, along with the mayor and councils of Madison Heights and Hazel Park, to the investiture ceremony. That's the official ceremony for the swearing in of a new judge. It's scheduled for Thursday, October 28th at 6 p.m. It'll be in the auditorium of Hazel Park Junior High School. If you have not seen this facility, it is quite beautiful. It is almost brand spanking new. It's a very nice uh, school. And I'm very much looking forward to this, this uh, investiture at Hazel Park Junior High School. I'm also inviting everybody in Madison Heights, Ferndale, and Hazel Park who's interested in attending this, this ceremony, please feel free to attend. Hazel Park Junior High School is located at 22770 Highland Street in Hazel Park. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing everybody there. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing the mayor and council members there. I will work very hard for you as the new 43rd District Court Judge in the city of Hazel Park. I will do my best. You know I served for 10 years on your side. I know what tough times our cities are going through. I know how much the courts are part of that budgetary process. I remember being on your side during the budgetary process. So I'm looking forward to working with the cities in the 43rd District Court and doing my best as your new judge. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Always good to see a mayor, and, and uh, the mayor was a, was a mentor to me, and we appreciate seeing you again, and, and congratulations on, on being the judge. And again, uh, the beautiful, lively downtown is largely a result of at least the beginning of what you did, and then Thank followed you. by Mayor Porter. Thank you, Congratulations, sir. Congratulations, Judge. Congratulations. Madam Clerk, next item, please. We have a public hearing, Your Honor, on the CDBG program year 2010. Yes, we do. Would we get, uh, please, a brief introduction to this public hearing um, by our 
a wonderfully efficient and lovely CDS director. Thank you. Good evening. It is once again time for our annual required community development block grant public hearing. Uh, this year I am actually recommending that we eliminate one program that would be the beautification, the planting of the trees. Up to this point from 2003 uh, through this year we've planted over 200 trees um, in all census tracts east of Woodward. Um, but this will allow for additional funding um, as we have received um, $3,152 more than we got last year. And um, eliminating this program will allow us to give more money to Haven, which I know is close to the mayor's heart, and Ulsha, which handles the maintenance and snow removal for our elderly and physically challenged. Um, and I recommend that you um, pass it as um, recommended. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Shear. Before we get to any questions of, from council, we will hold a public hearing. So uh, I do call to order the public hearing, uh, as mentioned, at the time and date as publicized. This is a time when anyone in the audience may speak on the issue uh, before us, which is to uh, adopt the uh, CDBG budget for this program year. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Um, my name is Megan Widman. I'm the Director of Social Action at Haven. Um, you have been supporting our programs for many years now, and I'm primarily here tonight just to thank you and also to give you a brief update on what we've been doing the last year. Um, and if you don't know what Haven does, we provide assistance to victims of domestic violence and sexual violence. We do that through an emergency shelter, first responders that respond 24 hours a day to um, an assault, so they're with victims immediately following an assault. We also have court advocacy, which we provide right here in the Ferndale District Court. Um, and we have counseling programs. All of these programs are absolutely 100% free. We never charge victims for the services we provide, and that's why we depend so much on the support we receive from communities like Ferndale. In the last year, we provided um, services to a 158 Ferndale residents. I just looked that number up. Um, I believe that number is up over last year. We do have an increase in the number of individuals seeking our services. Unfortunately, we wish that wasn't the case, but unfortunately it's not. Um, so we do support the entire county and provide free services to the entire county, but you should know that we are serving Ferndale residents and they are coming to us for help and assistance. So I just wanted to thank you for your support and I look forward to continued support and working with the City of Ferndale. Thank you. Mayor, Council, Suzanne Thomas Rowe, 159 East Camborn. I just have one question before we go forward with any other monies from the government. I have a question and I'm not sure who to ask. Um, since I sat on the board or sat in a meeting with Bob Bruner and Marcia Shear last year regarding the $3.5 million NSP money that we were given, I want to know what's happened with that program because as a realtor, I'm unable to sell those properties. So I really like to have um, a report with numbers and figures and how much is, how many homes are left and who the company was that was hired because I feel partly responsible for not asking more questions at the time I was in the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And I'll refer that back to the city manager and the, and the CDS director that doesn't pertain exactly to this, does it, sir? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else was to wish to speak on this particular public hearing? Seeing no more, then we will close the public hearing, open it up for council questions. Uh, I don't really have any, uh, certainly support the important work of Haven. It's unfortunate that we don't have the funding for trees this year, which is also important to me, I guess, one option might be to simply look to the private sector uh, and to look at charitable organizations such as the Greening of Detroit, the Arbor Foundation, and even individuals who can certainly purchase trees to put in the uh, area of their own yards between the sidewalk and the street um, because we certainly want to keep the greening of Ferndale to continue. Any questions from the council table? 
If not a motion, then to adopt the budget? I would the application, I'm sorry. I would move to approve the uh, Community Development Block Grant application for program year 2011 with the breakdown as follows. Code enforcement, $70,824. Public service activity general, $9,000. Public service activity haven, $4,000. Minor home repair, $5,500 and administration $2,000, totaling $19,324, and authorize the mayor to sign the grant application, the sub-recipient agreement. I don't think we can do this with those doors closed, can we? They're unlocked. They're unlocked, thank you. All right. And the minor home repair statutory checklist as responsible entity official signature. Thank you. Motion made. Is there a second, Councilman? I second. Thank you, sir. Uh, Motion made and seconded. Any discussion? Madam Clerk. Council Members Galloway? Yes. Baker? Yes. Mayor Covey? Yes, that passes. Uh, Madam Clerk, next item. That brings us to the call to audience, Your Honor. Thank you. The call to audience is the time when members in the audience may speak on any issue that they wish that is not on the agenda. For example, on the agenda tonight is uh, consideration of amendments to the noise ordinance. So this would not be the time for people to talk about the noise ordinance in case there's anyone here wishing to do so. But you may talk about other issues. Um, we have a few rules. One is that you, we ask that you speak less than three minutes total, and Councilman Galloway and I do time it. We ask that you share your name and address. We ask that you do not impugn the integrity of any individual and that you be as polite and succinct as possible. Anyone wish? We reserve 30 minutes maximum for this part of the meeting. Anyone wish to speak? Good evening. Mark Loeb, 2102 Roosevelt in Ypsilanti. I am the one who coordinates the Funky Ferndale Art Fair, which was about eight, nine days ago. And I just wanted to thank uh, Manager Bruner, Mayor Covey, and the Council and the fabulous uh, work of the police, fire, and DPW departments in making that a very successful show. We combined with the DIY show and a green fair and had a much larger attendance than we've been having before, and it went very smoothly thanks to everybody's assistance. Uh, I was tabulating the survey results uh, from our attendees, and I thought this was something that the council should hear, and that is, about one-third of the people that came to the shows are Ferndale residents, but more interesting even is about one-third of the people that came to the show only come to Ferndale occasionally, and some of them, 10%, this was the first time they had ever been in Ferndale. Cool. So these shows are doing what we're trying to get them to do, bring people into Ferndale, and hopefully bringing them back again and again to support the local businesses. Well, Mr. Loeb, thank you for doing a great job. It was a great fair. <laughs> Douglas Christie, Ferndale resident. Hello, Mayor Covey and Council. I am here today uh, representing the Ferndale Environmental Sustainability Commission, and I would like to make an announcement for our next Green Tuesday. It's always the second Tuesday of the month, so that would make it October 12th at the Coolick Community Center. And uh, October's topic is on saving money and staying warm this winter, uh, winterizing your home for efficiency. Uh, the event is from 6.30 to 8 o'clock, and we will have a uh, speaker uh, during that time. So again, that's on the 12th of October. And the other item I wanted to mention uh, is at the um, DIY Street Fair on, uh, again, about nine days ago. The environmental group and the Sierra Club volunteered and collected more than a 1,000 pounds of uh, items that were uh, stopped from going to the trash and were sent to Sakura to be recycled. And over uh, $200 worth of returnables, which went to some of the volunteers that helped out um, that uh, don't always have a place to sleep at night. Um, and, uh, of course, I saw a lot of DIY souvenir cups that went home with people. So I just wanted to thank all of the visitors for uh, putting stuff into the right bins and the DPW and Sakura and, of course, all the volunteers to make uh, it a wonderful event and keep uh, Ferndale uh, rocking and green. Thank
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Christie. Good job. Anyone else tonight? Good evening, Mayor, Council. Patrick Sheehan, Ferndale Fire Union President, <coughs> Local 812. Uh, I'm going to be real, real quick here tonight because as you've already led to, there's a lot of people here with some important business. Um, what I wanted to do tonight, and unfortunately Councilman Len is not here, I wanted to go through the chair to you and thank Councilman Lennon for uh, inquiring at the last meeting about the recent reduction in our uh, daily minimum safety manning. Um, you know, our reduction, we've, went, we've re reduced our manpower daily for 25% to, uh, from 8 to 6. And, um, you know, we, we just want to thank uh, Councilman Lennon because uh, I, I don't think the citizens were even aware of that. And um, what they are probably aware of is that uh, they're noticing that there's a, a lot more fire engine uh, traffic going down 9 Mile, Camborne, and uh, Marshall and even 8 Mile on any of the east-west thoroughfares, our fire, our fire lanes, because we're having to cross sides of town to, to hit the runs that we're, we're basically down an engine. And um, like I said, the only reason why I'm bringing that up tonight is because uh, what, what we have noticed, the firefighters have noticed, is that uh, in our responding, Again, town is doing great. Downtown is thriving. But what we've noticed, though, is that there's a lot more traffic going down Nine Mile. There's a lot more traffic going down Camborne and going down uh, uh, Marshall. And what we've also noticed is that, uh, you know, as the, the days of a driver's training has kind of uh, got a little bit eased, uh, people aren't necessarily remembering to do what they're supposed to do when there's an emergency vehicle. And, and all, all we're asking tonight, the only reason why I'm here tonight, is uh, we're just trying to deliver the message that, you know, to the citizens is to help us help you and, and your neighbor. Because, uh, you know, I, I do want to protect m my membership and my guys because, you know, we don't want to hit anybody, but ultimately we don't want to kill anybody. And, and it's uh, that's sincere. And... Um, you know, just remember to, if you, if you see an emergency vehicle, to uh, safely merge to the right and stop till, till we get by. Make sure that if it's one or two engines, make sure everybody gets by you. And, and again, don't panic when you do this. Um, if you have to, worst case scenario, and you don't know what to do, then just stop where you're at. But please remember to put your hazards on, and that will give us a, an idea that we know that you know what's going on. And, um, you know, the only other thing I guess I would say to the citizens is just, you know, I, I want to make sure that every citizen understands that no matter what happens, no matter how many people show up at their house at a fire, whether it be eight or it be one, and they're inside, we're going to do everything we can to come in and get you. And I just, that's only our message tonight, and thank you very much. Thank you, Firefighter Shahan. Hello, Ian Drive, 524 Withington, and I just came out tonight to remind everybody that on Sunday, October 10th, there will be the Crop Walk for Hunger, and it will start at Drayton Avenue Presbyterian Church. Registrations at 1.30, the walk, it's a six-mile walk. It begins at 2 p.m. So I want to invite people to either donate to www.cropwalkonline.org, sponsor someone, or come out and join us for the walk. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to speak during the call to audience? All right, then we're going to read off the consent agenda and then move into the uh, regular agenda. Madam Clerk? Consent agenda item A, approval of the minutes of the meetings held September 13th and September 20th, adoption of a resolution supporting an amendment state law to prohibit the possession of firearms by members of the general public at public festivals. Item C, approval of the purchase of eight Raptor RP-1 radar units at $1,237 each from Custom Signal and one 2020 ultralight LRB laser speed detector device at $2,702 from Laser Technology for a total cost of $12,598 
monies to be split between the Justice Assistance Grant and the remaining balance of $380 from the general fund. Item D, approval of the grass and weeds contract as submitted by the Community Development Department. Item E, approval of the snow and ice contract as submitted by the Community Development Director. Item F, approval to purchase the Vincent Chin Memorial Plaque at a cost not to exceed $2,600 and to charge the expense to 101441740 DPW General Fund Operating Supplies. And finally, item G, approval of the bills and payrolls as certified by the city manager to be paid subject to review by the Council Finance Committee. Well done, Madam Clerk. Um, I would like to pull item C, as in CAT, for a brief, uh, brief discussion. Any other items folks would like to pull from the audience or the table? I would move that we adopt the consent agenda uh, with the exception of item C. Support. Thank you, uh, Councilman uh, Councilperson Baker makes the motion, and Councilman Galloway seconds the motion. Uh, all the items except C adopted. Madam Clerk. Council Members Baker. Yes. Galloway. Yes. And Mayor Covey. Yes, thank you. Next item, Madam Clerk. That brings us to, I've lost my place, regular agenda item A, consideration of amendments to the noise ordinance. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Now, we did bring this uh, issue up at a special council meeting last Monday, and it was uh, well discussed and explained by the city uh, attorney. Um, who would like to introduce it again tonight with a brief description of what it's doing or attempting to do? Uh, Mr. Bruner or Mr. Christ? I'd, invite Your Honor, I'd be happy to do that, and I'll try and keep it brief. And, and uh, in simple words for everyone to understand. I'll try, As opposed Honor. to legalese. I'll try, Your Honor. He's an attorney. Sometimes you have to remind uh, him. Thank as you. council knows, uh, for the last several months, there's been a number of complaints raised by residents uh, with respect to concerns over noise levels uh, within the city, and in particular in residential districts of the city. Uh, the DDA has had several meetings, uh, one in July and at least one in August, uh, to study the issue. Uh, and certain recommendations from the DDA uh, have been made, and, and those recommendations, uh, as set forth in their minutes, are included uh, in Council's packet of information. Uh, additionally, since those complaints have been uh, raised to Council, the Ordinance Committee has also uh, considered and reviewed the existing uh, noise ordinance and uh, evaluated whether any uh, potential amendments could be made to that ordinance to uh, attempt to address some of the concerns that have been raised. Uh, at the meeting uh, last Monday evening uh, before council, a uh, uh, review of the ordinance committee was made uh, and uh, a discussion took place with respect to uh, some of the DDA concerns, some of the uh, suggestions that they raised for fur further study which included the possibility of uh, outdoor speaker plan uh, review, uh, potential issue and consideration of uh, whether there should be any type of a regulation or further regulation of amplified uh, sound devices uh, outside, uh, and also their uh, recommendation that the city consider hiring a sound uh, expert or engineer to provide uh, guidance and uh, suggestions to council. Uh, additionally, Council heard the Ordinance Committee's recommendation re with respect to certain uh, intermediate steps that could be taken uh, immediately while this issue uh, is continued to be uh, studied and reviewed. Uh, those included uh, a proposed amendment which would identify more clearly in the ordinance uh, the uh, threshold of maximum sound level uh, for uh, a reading under the DBA or DBC schedule uh, and that the uh, level where the sound was measured uh, would, uh, that particular zone district would be the, uh, the threshold or the sound level that was applied. The Ordinance Committee also suggested the elimination of the distinction between sound level uh, measurement thresholds, maximum thresholds on the DBA scale, uh, suggesting that that be consistent with the residential zone district. Uh, there was also a recommendation by the Ordinance Committee that the maximum uh, threshold for the DBA scale be reduced by 10 decibels Sunday through, Thursday, Sunday through Wednesday uh, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. 
excuse me, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and then the level be reduced Thursday through Saturday by 10 decibels on the DBA scale from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Finally, there was a suggestion by the committee that the DBC weighting, uh, that the current uh, commercial level uh, between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. be reduced to the residential uh, maximum threshold uh, for that period of time. Thank you, Mr. Christ. Very clear. <laughs> really well. well done. Um, so here's the process. Uh, we will first allow council members to ask any questions or request any information. We'll then allow uh, other folks if they would like to ask questions about the issue. Then we would look for a possible motion based on that uh, initial bit of questioning as to whether we would uh, have a motion tonight. And then at that point, folks could share their opinions on the issue. Um, so I guess the only question I would have, Mr. Christ, is e even though last Monday we did have some discussion about the idea of, of hiring a consultant, a, a sound expert, to give us their thoughts on how to change these numbers, to lower them or not, or to lower them by a certain number, um, that's not contained in tonight's discussion. That would have to be added on or... or well, that, that could be a motion that council considers the... as council decided last meeting uh, a week ago, council decided it was not going to take any, any action at that study session, which was for review. So uh, what was brought forward this evening essentially is that previous recommendation from the Ordinance Committee. Uh, obviously, council has a lot more information regarding the background and potential issues which uh, may need further study. But uh, uh, those uh, run a wide gamut of, of a possible uh, action items. And uh, you know, certainly the consideration in, uh, of a possible sound expert would be one of those. If I could ask on noise, these areas do not include people cutting their lawn with a lawnmower or cutting down a tree. Those, those are separately worked on in other parts of the ordinance. Correct. The, the, the proposed amendments don't address that issue at all. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that you can still cut your grass up until 10 p.m. at night. Is, is, that, is that correct? I don't think there's any prohibition of when you, you cut your Actually, grass. Actually, I think there is. Um, in terms of work being performed, for example, you can't uh, use a Constru buzz saw. Construction is limited. Construction is limited? Okay. And I guess one of the questions I would ask through the through the uh, city attorney to the perhaps to the committee members um, is is what was the reasoning on lowering the sound limit between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. had been 10 p.m. all along. Well, the, the if I could, uh, that issue was raised uh, in connection with the review of the uh, various amendments that have happened to that noise ordinance where. There previously, until 2005, was not a distinction between commercial and residential uh, zone districts for the standpoint of maximum sound levels. And uh, in certain amendments that took place in 2005, that distinction uh, was introduced in the ordinance, and the uh, levels for the residential uh, zone districts on the DBA weighted scale run from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., whereas the commercial abutting district uh, runs from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. And so for a purpose of, of uh, ease of potential enforcement, it seemed to make sense to try and get one time frame. And the compromise that was proposed by the Ordinance Committee would be that it would be 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. on certain days and 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. on other days. And my last question is the, the thought on the different days, Sunday through Wednesday, a lower threshold, Thursday through Saturday, a slightly higher threshold. The, the threshold would actually be the same, but it, the hours would be earlier Sunday through uh, Wednesday as to when the lower level would apply, 7 p.m., rather than uh, 10 decibels higher on the Thursday, Friday, and Saturday evenings. Thank you. 
what would be the purpose of having a differentiation of different days of the week? Well, it, the ordinance committee uh, understood that there, those could be uh, days where there's more uh, evening activity in the central business district in particular. That was the thought that the committee was. From the table, any questions or requests for information? I have a question. Um, uh, Councilman Galloway, Councilman Lennon, and our city attorney are on the ordinance committee. Um, I understand that Councilman Lennon wasn't at um, the meeting where the recommendation um, was made. Um, and he's not with us this evening. So I guess the question is to the, the two of you who, who were there um, and went through this discussion. What, why 10 decibels? It, it feels like a bit of an arbitrary number. None of us are sound experts up here. I wondered um, just where that number came from. It's not a change, 10. It's currently reduced 10 decibels already. Uh, the question is when those, when those go into effect. So the 10 decibels already reduce. So we're uh, simply extending that reduction you're, you're several hours when forward those, in some cases. Right, and you're having a uniform time period for commercial and residential districts rather than a 7 to 7 and a 10 to 7 for others, which uh, coupled with the other recommendation regarding where the sound measurement, uh, the level is applied, uh, seem to uh, provide for a better enforcement uh, specter. And I guess my question of why 10 decibels goes back slightly further than that ordinance committee meeting. Um, if we were to decide that we wanted a, a larger investigation, um, I guess I would just want more information about what difference that really makes. Mm -hmm. yeah, as opposed to reducing it more or less. Or 74, perhaps reducing it further based on an expert or someone measuring. Is it, it's been about 10 years since we actually did measurements out there in the street. 2000, correct, Your Honor. Okay. Huge change in our downtown since then. Any requests for information from the floor? I see one coming, and then Brian Kramer after Marsha Shear. I just want to clarify whether any changes are uh, proposed for the industrial standards. There's no changes proposed for the industrial district. Thank you. You're very welcome. Brian, go ahead and take this podium if you have a question. Brian Kramer, just for questions at this time, no comments. Um, there's a handful of residents, uh, residents that are pushing this issue on sound, and I'd like to know with the current proposed ordinance, did anybody from the sound committee, the ordinance committee, go meet with these people and say, if we change it at these times to these decimals, we're going to take some sound meter readings, will this satisfy you, will this make you happy? Was that done? The committee didn't have that type of uh, dialogue with the adjacent residents. There's been some discussion with a, a few residents, but nothing of the nature of having a, a, a uh, readings taken uh, with them present. That that was not broached. Well, there was a three-hour meeting uh, a week yeah. ago where more than just a handful, That's probably about ten folks came, and we discussed this quite a bit, actually. So. When I say a handful, I'm talking about 20,000 residents in the city of Ferndale. And even if you have 350 people who signed a petition, it's a handful. And I just think that since these people are complaining every week, we'd like to make sure that they're happy with this proposal. And I would think that we would go to their house with a sound meter. Here's the proposal. Here's the times. What do you think? Because if we're taking all these steps and it's not going to make them happy anyway, I'm not sure why we're going down that road. If I could, I think those, that may be a step, uh, a secondary step. I mean, these were initial thoughts from the, the Ordinance Committee, and certainly, uh, as I indicated, further uh, data and the possible consultation with an expert with respect to uh, different sound levels is an option for Council to consider. That hasn't been done yet. Based on the current proposal, um, if... Um Rosie O'Grady's take sound meter readings, we take five a night. Out of the 300 that I brought with me today, less than 5% of the sound meter readings that we take would um, be impacted by this proposal. So again, based on this information, it, it's not going to solve the problem at the Troy and Allen with the current proposal. Um, has anybody reviewed the economic impact to the city 
that if it does hurt the businesses in the downtown, more specifically the restaurants, how it would affect the city with less customers coming to the city, with less parking revenue, with less overflow? Has anybody said how will this affect the business owners, if any, good or bad, in this ordinance well, committee? Actually, uh, Mr. Kramer, that's a question I asked to the um, DDA director last week. Uh, what, if any, journals or publications might have studied that in the import of amplified music on outdoor patios? And, you know, she wasn't able to point us to any. Um, but certainly if there's some trade magazines that you have or articles that would reference the importance of having, you know, uh, music on a patio, uh, we'd be interested in seeing them. It's not clear to this body. No one's presented any um, scientific or studies that suggest that music is necessary at all. It seems to make sense on some level that, you know, you run a place such as your own, you need to have music, but no one's presented any information saying that any sort of scientific study has been done. Let me jump in because that's sort of a question and, uh, and certainly some of us have real life experience, but Christine, would you share, has there been any recommendation from the DDA since our meeting last Monday? Has your body uh, made any decisions or recommendations? There is, but first I want to address um, Mr. Galloway's um, question from last week because I was definitely not prepared for that question. But since that time, I have looked into that a little bit further. Um, there's more studies that were done that were done in the UK. Um, but you'll find that through um, some of these studies that were done, uh, Independent Research Company Entertainment Media Research Limited, uh, that when given a choice between Christmas shopping with or without music, a remarkable 95% of consumers said that they prefer shopping with in-store music. And I would say that would hold true with anyone who is out in a downtown area. Obviously, we have a different environment than an enclosed mall. 25% of people say they would spend more if music is playing, as it makes them feel more festive and more generous. Music encourages a positive attitude towards a product by associating it with emotionally connecting music. Changing the tempo affects human activity. It make, can make them stay longer and spend more money. Radio shifts the lif listener's emotional state to encourage a different behavior, which basically can put people in a more positive frame of mind. And I think more positive thinkers usually have a little bit more money to spend sometimes, too. <laughs> um, probably the most well-known example of music research experiment was conducted by North Hargreaves and McKendrick. This involved, and this is just intriguing in how this um, really has an impact on consumer buying habits. This involved playing a mixture of French and German music next to a supermarket display of French and German wines over a two-week period. When French music was played, French wine outsold German wine by five bottles to one. Conversely, when German music was played, German wine outsold French wine by nearly two bottles to one. As the present um, results of the studies, it demonstrates that music may affect the atmosphere of an establishment, and it also seemed reasonable, um, based on the surveys, that it suggests that it may con consequently influence the variables of patronage frequency, money spent, store choice, brand loyalty, promotion sensitivity, price sensitivity, response to new brands. And from this research, it is clear that music could be seen as a feature of an establishment. It should be used to create the right atmosphere for the business and therefore pull in potential consumers who may increase profits. Any way that you look at it, this research proves that music deserves to be considered carefully as a potential research business tool. The results of the research on the effect of music on customers' estimates of the maximum amount that they would be prepared to pay suggest that music could be a factor in determining price policy also. So with that in mind, yes, it does have an impact. Uh, the DDA uh, today met, and we had uh, nearly almost everybody in, in attendance today, and we had a unanimous decision on, uh, in discussion to the proposed ordinance at the table today. Uh, the DDA supports and encourages a strong, mutually beneficial relationship with the residents surrounding the downtown district. Any change to the existing noise ordinance could prove detrimental to both downtown businesses and residents. A thriving downtown directly impacts and improves surrounding residential property values. 
Consequently, the DDA recommends that prior to any modification of the existing noise ordinance, that further study of a sound levels, including updated measurements by a sound level expert and their impact on downtown business and residents be further undertaken. Thank you, Christine. I find that when I listen to uh, Mexican music, it makes me want to drink Corona beer sometimes. <laughs> um, Councilwoman Baker? Through the chair, a question for the DDA director. Um, you've had um, a sound expert come to at least one uh, public meeting. Mm -hmm. Any, um, if the city were to retain that expert or someone with a similar background, um, do you have any, you know, sort of uh, educated guess as to how long it would take to prepare an actionable report? Time is sort of of the essence, but we want to do a good job. Right. I, I think, you know, and it does depend on to what extent you're asking them to do. Are you going to have them conduct the sound level, level measurements as well? Because you're going to want to make sure that you do it at different times of the day um, and different seasonal changes. And um, Mr. Chris is pretty aware of some of those impacts that can impact sound, um, the level of sound. Um, but I think that um, in my general discussions with the one that I had um, met with, uh, the their hourly rate is, is reasonable, um, but if you can clearly define what it is that you're looking for them to do, I think they can be fairly direct in, in keeping um, your money and your time, um, you know, in their mind in terms of being able to produce something and come back. We're actually starting to work with the gentleman to produ um, produce a document that would be an educational piece for the businesses that just educates them on what sound is and how to better manage that within their own environment. Do you think uh, a few thousand dollars in 30 days would be sufficient? Probably. All right, thank mm -hmm. you. All right, we're still in the requesting information, asking questions phase. Anyone else? I want to be sure I understand where would the uh, base measurement be taken? You said something about changing with the DVC level, the, the C weight decibel level. C I indicated that the recommendation from the committee was that the uh, C-weighted threshold uh, be changed in the commercial district from 10 p.m. Uh, to 7 a.m., which is how it is currently at uh, 80 dBC, to 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. and reduced to the residential level, which is 75 dBC. And it would be measured from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. In the commercial area. And so it wouldn't make a difference where it's measured. It's right. still the it same would, level. It, it would be the residential level, though. Right. All right, because we, we have at least one violation that, that would have been ticketed, clearly ticketed, based on decibels alone, not based on misery of the neighbors. Um, if it had been at a residential, since it was measured on a to just a couple of feet from two residences. Um, th th this sounds worth a try to see if it does alleviate it. Uh, there's the situation of heavy base that we neighbors hear, not just West Troy, it also goes into Saratoga and such, all winter through the ground. My understanding of technology is the source of the vibration that causes that to go through the ground uh, is the place where you you make the damping, you make the uh, changes. Is there any way of wording an ordinance to require that of whatever business is causing that vibration to go through the ground into people's homes? Something we could ask of a sound expert. Yeah, I, think, I don't know the answer. The sound uh, expert, Mr. Dieter, could probably answer that. But in this case of this ordinance tonight, 75 would be the limit including standing right next to, say, Rosie O'Grady's or mm -hmm. Soho, and 75 would be the DBC limit. So it is being lowered according to this. Okay, it, it hit over 75 um, on the, the worst day we'd had, and that was just two weeks ago. Um, we had several, many of us neighbors were out on the street with that one. Um, 
I mentioned before that a free press article indicated that the fi top five restaurant complaints, one of them was the music's too loud. And in fact, a 19-year-old friend of my daughter's said he visited the DIY for less than 10 minutes because it was too loud. And this is a 19-year-old boy, young man. Okay, we are in the question phase. Okay. If you have any requests for information. Well, so but that leads me to the question about mm -hmm. special events. I didn't hear that mentioned. I, the Christmas music, that was something that I've indicated that at, at Christmas time, as long as it gets turned off at 10 o'clock and doesn't go all night, uh, that that... I understand, and that's what I thought it was initially for. But special events, otherwise, are not included in this. Special this events change. have their can have their own special event permit, and so things like the Dream Cruise or the Pride Festival uh, are not being. They're okay. not falling into. It, is this. it part of special event policy that the special event approval could limit the decibels if you find that that is not? Yes. It has in the past. Council gets to do that if it chooses it, it to. It does. Has it ever now, done that? Chuck That's Gettard, yes. Yes, we have. Chuck, recently. Mayor Gettard was curious, uh, Mr. Christ, about the marching band, not, not on a parade, but on the weekly evenings that they practice. Most of us can hear the marching band in the evenings from the high school during weekdays when they're practicing. Would this uh, ordinance impact on our high school marching band? The proposed amendments do not address that at all. Uh, the, the amendments address uh, certain s portions of 2-100 of the Ferndale Code of Ordinances. As Council knows, there is a general uh, section of 2-98, uh, which provides a, uh, a general prohibition on creating unnecessary loud or disturbing noise. The committee's recommendation is not to change that. Uh, one could argue that somebody could make a complaint on that. However, that has not been uh, utilized uh, by the department for enforcement for, for that type of situation in the past. Your Honor, if I may, um, the marching band is exempt in, in 100 in the, in the exemptions. In the general exemptions. Right. Right. That's right. And, and I think they practice from four to six or something like that. That's what I was told. Thank you, Chief Collins. All right, other questions? Requests for information. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I want one, one more thing. As Mr. Loeb was leaving, I did personally thank him for the fact that he kept his word and he kept the, the noise on the west side of Nine Mile non-competitive with the art fair and in the spirit of it, and it was wonderful. Appreciate it I'm very sorry, much. we're asking for people to ask questions, Mrs. I Mel. wanted to say something nice. Well, appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just a point of clarification. Um, in Section 2-102 under of the general exemptions, it seems like there would be a conflict of interest with the times in numbers 6 and 7 with the proposed times um, in the... Um, in the ordinance at the table. Well, I mean, seven's talking about uh, construction activity and limiting it to seven to ten. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a, a conflict. You still have the the uh, threshold levels of 2-100 there. But then what would people follow? Would they actually follow the time time in the section 100 or would they actually follow 102 because well, that is the where general, the general exemption the specific language of that general exemption would supersede the general provision of 2-100 from a statutory construction standpoint okay Yeah, we can't take action, but, we're, but we can continue discussion. Okay. Well, no, it's going to happen. I, I took a break. Um, pardon us, uh, audience, but because we only have three council members, uh, which is unusual, um, a quorum is required to conduct business, and there's only three of us, and that is the quorum. But if folks need to take a break, that's certainly acceptable, and, and we can continue discussion. We are done, I think, with the request, with the request for information phase. We're going to move into the uh, 
uh, action phase, although um, no action can we can't be take any action right now well, at the maybe moment. Maybe let me ask a few. <laughs> I'll, 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 <laughs> I'm after you. Um, that won't work. <laughs> and these are just the rules of council, and I know a lot of people are here for the first time, but in order to debate an issue, we need a motion on the floor, and that motion could be to adopt the ordinance as presented. It could be a motion with amendments. It could be a motion to table. Councilman, go yeah, ahead. I'll propose a, a motion and see where it goes. Um, I would move that uh, City Council table consideration of uh, the ordinance amending the uh, sound ordinance until the second regularly scheduled meeting, uh, I'm sorry, uh, until the first regularly scheduled meeting in November and uh, direct the uh, DDA and the CDS director to uh, collaborate on um, the retention of a, uh, of, uh, a sound engineer to develop some uh, guidelines or point us in directions of resources that uh, we can consider and uh, or recommendation even based and a recommendation on for uh, you know changes uh, that may be non sound pressure measurement mm -hmm. based so that could include well so Probably. if someone will second that I'll, I'll I guess look at it. So my thought is here that, as I've stated in the newspaper several times, um, I don't think um, if whether we make these numbers 55, 45, or 105, um, that is going to solve the problem. Uh, it seems to me that some sort of uh, site plan solution with uh, the proper direction of speakers and or uh, physical limiting of uh, you know uh, levels that speakers are broadcast at uh, is what needs to be done. Um, I think that the, um, the neighbors have uh, a legitimate concern on some level, but uh, I think uh, the proposed solution here is I've thought more about it and talked to more people about it is not the workable solution. So I think we're going to need to get more information and um, you know I would hope that uh, the DDA would share some of the cost of that uh, investigation and when we bring it back to council in November, we'll have a lot more information. I appreciate that motion. The motion was made and seconded by Galloway and uh, Baker to table the item uh, and to request the CDS director and the DDA director to uh, engage. Was it to engage a sound, and a sound yeah. expert? Um, and if, if, if they choose, they could come back with a, with a range or a, a budget. Um, I hear you asking them to share, if you can, the, uh, somehow share the cost. So it might have to come back to us if we need to, depending on the amount of money and whether it requires a vote of council or a contract. But that could come back to us before the second meeting in November. We it, could get started it could come at in, our next meeting. It could come in two weeks. And, and you added some things, but I, I, I think I That's would just take it in a general <laughs> sense of expertise. And you're right, Councilman because we are allowed to share opinions now, lowering it to 55 or 50 or 45 might not solve the problem, but it could, it could shut down the downtown because the expert tells us that this kind of conversation that you're hearing right now is at 60 to 65. So when you get close to getting down to that number, um, you're actually running the risk of, of silencing the downtown, in my opinion. So we have a motion on the floor, and it is to table the motion. Uh, or table the item for about five weeks. Uh, anyone wish to speak on the issue? I would. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, this, this question and, and the things that we've been hearing from the residents over the last year, and I appreciate that there are a lot of people who are here to speak tonight, uh, but we have, we have several residents who have educated themselves quite extensively on this, as well as several business owners. Um, this is a conversation that's been going on, and I'm glad that we are now setting a firm timetable to move forward. I imagine they are as well. Um, and this is a bigger issue, as we've heard over the last year, than simply sound waves um, and bass going through the ground, although that is certainly a part of it. Um, I imagine that when uh, we come back to consider this um, with some firm information from a sound expert um, who, you know, I hope will Maybe you know go as far as giving us recommendations about 
how we might help businesses or residents to deal with soundproofing issues. You know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we get a recommendation that has um, some more substantive solutions than simply turning down the volume. Uh, Attorney Chris, since this is a motion to table, am I correct in allowing uh, discussion on this? Sure. It's really not a motion to table. It's the, the, the way <coughs> the motion seemed to be to, to bring fine. back the, the consideration of the noise issue uh, and to direct uh, right. those departments. So, so I think conversations it is okay. Madam Clerk, can you tell us where the, what the status is of that additional uh, petitioned noise ordinance change um, that is different from what we're talking about tonight and has uh, much lower numbers and where we are in that process? Certainly the um, initiative petition is um, currently lacking enough valid signatures. The circulators have until Wednesday the 29th to turn in a sufficient number of valid signatures for council to have to move forward. And on then that at that point the ballot issue would could go on to the ballot, when would that happen? Depending on the number of valid signatures, either at the next regularly scheduled election or at a possibly at a special election. So February, is that? February 22nd is an election date, which may or may not come in, may or may not be a regular election date right. based on what happens with the Constitutional Convention. Or a special election? Depending on how many are. What's that? Depending on how many. How many, how many valid signatures the petition right, Thank contains. you. All right. Anyone in the audience wish to speak on the issue? And you certainly can be as brief as you can. <laughs> I will. My name is Francine Hatchum. I live at 355 West Troy, which is probably about five houses from Nine Mile and Allen. And I represent a group of people who the sound does not bother at all. We walk up to, um, <laughs> we walk downtown every day to either have breakfast, lunch, dinner, happy hour, or entertainment. And everyone in those places are all locals, and the people love us, and we love them. And we go to all these businesses because we're all fundraisers. Everyone in Ferndale has fundraised. We go to these people every day, every month, saying, can you give us this? Can you, give, can you open your bar? Can you open it? Give a certificate? Can you do that? And they do because it's, it's, it's a circle. And it just seems like this link is being broken by thinking, I hope the businesses don't think that we're stabbing in the, in the back because we're not. We want to support them, and they support us. We are community, and we are Ferndale. Thank you. Hi. Michael Hennis. I own uh, the restaurant housed by you in Ferndale. Uh, every, every restaurant plays uh, music in their stores. Every restaurant that plays music in the stores plays music on their cafes and patios. Uh, we do it for two reasons, create a mood and to mask other noises, like uh, kitchen noises or neighboring tables conversations. Um, so I guess everyone has a noise pet peeve. And, uh, and mine is if you're in, you're in line at a bank and uh, there's a guy with a Bluetooth or something is there and he's talking to his cell phone and it sounds like his conversation is twice as loud as anyone else's. And the reason it is, it sounds that way, is because there's nothing to mask it. There's nothing to cover it up. There's no music or anything in the background. Um, we have a satellite music system and a storm comes through and knocks out the music. It makes a very uncomfortable feeling in the restaurant. Um, so and because you can hear everyone else's conversations, you hear it's it, the, the mood changes instantly. So one of the unintended consequences of uh, eliminating outside music is uh, we're going to have less people in the cafes. We're going to they're not going to stay as long. They're not going to come out in the same numbers, but you're going to be able to understand what they're saying at your houses because there's nothing to, to cover it up. There's no ambient noise. To, to mask it. Thank you. Hi, Joel Petrie is the vice chair of the uh, Financial Budget Commission of uh, 12 Citizens. Uh, if I have this straight, I'd like to ask a question. In the next 30 days, you're proposing spending some money on a sound expert for a, a position that Mr. Kramer brought up. 
of the 300 some people who have signed or were solicited to sign that petition for noise, less than 4% showed up at the meeting? Is that your question? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Petrie uh, did call me over the weekend during DIY and told me that the DIY was so loud that uh, he actually could hear it over at Martin Road Park. And yet I think, I think you understand that once a year there's going to be a loud concert around September. I work concert security since 78. <laughs> a mile and a quarter away, I've got to say myself, at 10 after 11 is excessive. 10.30, maybe okay. Thank you. You need to understand that those of us who have been tor tormented, disturbed by this, to use the, the ordinance language of disturbance, for over a year, having expressed our concerns in advance, and having all of those concerns and more become even worse than we could have anticipated, you need to understand that we're on the edge. Every one of the people who came last Monday, and there was not a lot of notice, and it wasn't any official notice of any kind. It was whoever we could get, and some of the people just, some feel hopeless. There's one couple who don't even bother calling the police because they're not going to do anything. Well, they come out, they don't even take measurements now. One police officer was there the night before, and, and he said, tonight it's not louder than last night, and last night didn't meet the commercial threshold in front of our lawns, so he wasn't going to take a measurement. But I know these people, and I know myself and my family, and we're on the edge. Lying down, I've, I've had in the past two months, I've had three episodes of chest pains, and finally with one of our neighbors being a nurse said, make sure you get that checked out. Well, the EKG is normal, and the doctor said, well, try to get some sleep. I can't. There is no way, there was, there was at least one time I called Rosie's and I said, this is before two o'clock on a Sunday, I said, I can hear some music on, on your patio, it's fine. I don't know what kind of music, it was, it was, it was I could audible, but not, not uh, to where it really, uh, barely audible. I could hear conversations, but not what anybody was saying. People were talking in a conversational tone. And I said, this is perfect. There's noise, there's conversation, there's music. It's perfect. Don't raise it. It's not bothering us here. It can be done. Mark Loeb proved you can have music, you can have entertainment. It doesn't have to blast people out. German music is two to one and is a fav as opposed to French five to one. That means we don't need to amplify an accordion for Oktoberfest. Do we? We can't take, something's got to be done and it's got to be done now. And just because there are just a few bars here who don't know how to be good neighbors doesn't mean the rest of us have to be turned into whiners, having our health affected. You've heard from me, from my daughter, about our health affected. This is not just Ferndale. This is all over the country where people are saying that, that noise does not have to rule. But greed is good. Hi, Joanne Wilcox, 1615 West Marshall. I have lived in Ferndale for most of my life. Oak Park, Ferndale, Pleasant Ridge for all of my life. Been married for 45 years and lived in Ferndale for most of that time. I have seen downtown Ferndale go from a ghost town to a vibrant downtown. We need it. I also know. <laughs> of a lot of people that work nights and have to sleep days. They use earplugs. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ryan Moore. I live off uh, 347 West Troy Street. 
I am, what, four, five houses away from downtown. Um, you know, I've never had an issue. I'm opposed to uh, the ordinance. I've never had an issue with the music whatsoever. I've never had the, uh, the bass emanate from the ground and make me buckle. Um, actually, I find <clears throat> if I can hear anything, if I'm getting closer to downtown, the music is refreshing. If I take my dog for a walk, um, I think it, it adds to the ambience. It gives uh, Ferndale a little moxie. It kind of really uh, it enhances a, a vibrant downtown uh, nightlife you know, and bringing people down here so they can, they can have a good time and enjoy. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Hello, I'm Emily Harold. I live at 262 West Troy. For those of you who don't know, there cannot be a closer building to Rosie O'Grady's than 262 West Troy. I do, in fact, practically share a wall. Never once have I lost any sleep from noise, and the only time I can even hear noise is if I'm sitting outside on my screen porch. Um, again, I've also lived in the area my entire life, Pleasant Ridge and Ferndale always, and it is amazing the difference between the way it was then and the way it is now, and I cannot believe that there's anyone wanting to push businesses out, wanting to give them evil stares and say that they're greedy for bringing revenue and taxes into the city. It's insane to me. My name is Tom Zarafa. I'm a resident of Oak Park, and I also live in the Ferndale School District of that city. I wish we had this problem in Oak Park. <laughs> Thank you. Oak Park is a dry city, is it not? <laughs> All right, my name is Rachel mitchell -Lizzie. I reside at 1144 East Camborne. It's Italian, I know, it's a long last name. Um, I, uh, I work in Ferndale, and I played in Ferndale, and just recently I bought my house in Ferndale because of the thriving community, and um, it's a great place to live. I wouldn't change it, and it needs to stay the way it is. My name is Rebecca Grabowski. I am a resident of actually Livonia, and I drive to Ferndale because of the way it is for the businesses and for the bars and for the nightlife. I wish we had this somewhere closer. And this is where I am buying my house at, is because of the way that Ferndale is with the community and with the businesses that they have. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. My name is John Ordoliva. I live at uh, 775 La Prairie. I just wanted to come down here. I was watching on TV, and I saw Mr. Kramer come up here, and I thought it was important that I come down here and tell him how much I appreciate him choosing to have his business in Ferndale. And the gentleman from House Bayou, thank you so much. I, I love your businesses. I know so many other people that enjoy going to your businesses also. My mom and dad came here from out of town last month, and we were walking in the downtown area, and my dad remarked how beautiful Rosie's was because last year when he came to visit me, he saw that it was a vacant building, and it looked like someone was going to finally renovate it. So thank you for being good neighbors. I really appreciate it. I know that you help keep my taxes down low, so I support you. And I know that there are thousands of other people in Ferndale that support it, support a vibrant downtown area. So I am against this, any kind of amendment for the noise ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else who's wishing to speak? Well, we will let people who haven't spoke first, traditionally that is the rule, then folks who have already spoken can speak a second time if they wish. Good evening. My name is Jackie Koivu. I live at 1100 Pinecrest. I've lived there for 26 years, and I'm soon to move. I'm sorry. I have lived across from the high school for 26 years. I've had the marching band for 26 years. I like the marching band. And if I needed to sleep, I would wear earplugs. Um, I have a hard time believing that those who are complaining about the noise ordinance are complaining about the noise, 
when they're making personal vendettas and personal stares, it, is, it appears to be personal, and that's a problem for me. So I support <laughs> not that. Brian Kramer, 181 Ardmore. I own Rosie O'Grady's and Cantina Diablos. I've invested almost $5 million in this community. The three of you sitting up there have either approved my special land use or approved my liquor license transfers. I've done exactly what I said I would do. I've obeyed the law. We have a plan. Stick with the plan. It's called your master plan. It was reviewed for over two years by the Planning Commission, by the DDA, by the City Council. You hired experts after experts. The master plan specifically calls for Nine Mile in Allen to be a restaurant with an outdoor patio. Rosie O'Grady's and Cantina Diablos brings eight to 10,000 people a week through our doors. Not all those people are Ferndale residents. The City of Ferndale and Brian Kramer, like it or not, are partners. Your parking revenue on Troy Street has doubled. There's businesses from the hair salons, the new pizza store that have specifically said they're locating to Allen and Troy Street and Nine Mile because of the traffic that Rosie O'Grady's brings. The DDA is currently dealing with a developer, Bob, I've always messed up his last name, Wolfson, Wolfson who's specifically working with the DDA to invest over $10 million in a parking structure and apartments. He's specifically doing that because of the vibe that downtown Ferndale is creating. He's not doing that because of 350 residents. He's doing it because of the downtown, and he sees the downtown on an upswing. Those property taxes alone would bring over $250,000 to the city of Ferndale, not including the parking revenue. Twelve of my employees specifically have located at the city of Ferndale in rent houses. Ten of my employees currently have bought houses because they work in the city of Ferndale. I'm asking that the city council does not cave in to pressure from a small percentage of people who are complaining about the ORS ordinance. Most people just don't complain. They don't show up. I got a call. This is important. I got almost 50 people here. If you guys say, Brian, get 500 signatures, it'd probably take me two weeks. I'll get you 500 signatures. Okay? Most of the people just don't complain. You have a handful of people complaining. I used to live at 181 Ardmore. Okay? I had one kid. It was great. I love the downtown. I had two kids. It didn't work for us. We moved to Washington Township. I didn't come to the city and say, you know what? I want to change the criteria from what I based, bought my house. I don't like the mobile gas station anymore. I don't have kids. I don't like the school you're putting me in. I don't like the noise coming from Como's. I didn't come to you guys and use any political pull or friendship pull. Change the city. I bought my house. Buyer beware. I knew exactly what I was buying. Luckily, I didn't sell the house. Now I'm moving back to it. I could have moved anywhere I wanted. I love downtown Ferndale. Curious Point, Washington Township, uh, Hidden Hills Subdivision. We had a handful of residents out of 40. They were complaining they didn't like our landscaping. They were complaining that the sidewalks need to be replaced. They were complaining that the curbs need to be replaced. Board of Directors for our uh, subdivision, our association, said no. They went to the city. They said, city, we want you to pay for it. Township. Township says we're broke, but I tell you what. Because you have the problem, we're willing to fix the problem, and we'll give you a 10-year special assessment. So if we want to spend 200 grand to do this, you guys want to fix it. It's not imperative to the city right now. We'll fix it. We'll pay for it. Give you a 10-year special assessment. You have a handful of residents. 350, 351 residents out of 20,000 is a handful. If you guys want to address the problem, the sound expert has come in, put up a wall, put up trees, block this off, probably cost $100,000. Let them pay for it. See how many residents then sign the petition. You guys have a problem that's unique to your house. If there was a railroad track, would you stop the train? If there was an airport, would you stop the planes? You bought your houses in the downtown. Buyer beware. You had no expectations that the city-owned property or private-owned property in a commercial district didn't have a right to change. I respect their points of view. The city's changing. At some point, you got to take a stand. Thank you, Brian.
All right. Again, uh, if there are any other folks who would like to speak who haven't Wait. spoken yet and have Wait. something new or something uh, that they would was like Kramer's to say. That was Kramer's second time, wasn't it? First time during the discussion of the proposed uh, motion item. Hi there, Eric Brown, resident. Um, real quick, I just, I mean, how quiet do you want it? I, I'm 35, I remember in the early 90s and late 80s, it was quiet, it was really quiet. And I mean, the sounds that you hear coming out of the downtown area is the sound of success. And uh, I mean, we're in, uh, I think everyone's noticed we're in a recession These, and we are really, we're competing for, people have very limited uh, disposable income and they have choices. They can go to Oilo, can go to Birmingham, they can go to Clawson, or they can come to Ferndale, and we need to do everything possible within reason uh, to make them come back and to continue to spend their dollars here with us. That's it. Thank you. Hello. My name's Angela Vincent, and I'm the owner-manager of Club 9. Um, in regards to what's been proposed so far in regards to the ordinance, in regards to the ordinance um, I strongly suggest that there be some type of study involved in regards to what other cities in Oakland County are doing. Um, in regards to this problem, also how is it going to affect the progressiveness of the city and um, the economic base? Because as, I mean, we're coming up on one year here in Ferndale, um, investing in the city and investing in the residents and providing something, you know, great for them to attend to. And we just want to continue that and also build on the progressiveness of Ferndale um, as it was when we got here. So just keep moving forward with the master plan. Thank you, Angela. First of all, this is personal. It is very personal. And my neighbors and I have lived in that, the, the house longer than Mr. Kramer's has lived in his any house he had here or any business he had here. Um, when he's talking, as my 19-year-old daughter said, we're not trying to have him turn it off, just down. The stores that are benefiting from Rosie's, I think Rosie's outside patio is fine. A little bit of music, I was walking uh, through the Withington parking lot and I heard a little bit of music. And I looked over and, and it was Inyo and it had just one speaker and it had some mood music out there and I could, I could barely hear it and what I heard was, was pleasant and it was at a pleasant tone. As I said, I've called Rosie's when I said, this is good. People are talking at a conversational level. How loud? Loud enough for those who came to hear it, to hear it. And that's all the louder it has to be. Mr. Loeb proved that with the art festival. If you want to hear it, you go to Nine Mile Road and you can hear it. If you don't want to hear it, you don't have it forced into your ears. Some people don't want to wear earplugs because they want to be able to be uh, hearing what they need to hear, whether it's their children or anything else. Whatever $250,000 revenues, I don't think that's how much the, that we're getting out of any business that would have located there would have had the same tax assessment. We're not getting income, as I understand it, off of the income he's making at that business or any of those other businesses, only the, the increased property tax. And the assessment for the improvement on that corner was $200,000 is what was assessed, not $3 million or whatever he said he moved it into. He saw the residences there when he did that. All we're saying is put it down to a level that your customers can hear it, but the rest of the people don't have to. Don't have to have it forced at us. Don't have to have it vibrating into our houses. That's not necessary. It's preventable. Ferndale is good neighbors. He can, those bars can be good neighbors. Villanova was a problem two or three years ago, and it was, it quieted back down and, and it could, could still entertain its customers. It didn't start going out of business because it was lower. Now it's higher because it's got Rosie's to compete with in terms of noise. You walk down West Troy all the way down and you're hearing one bar after another taking turns being too loud. We're not saying turn it off. We're just saying turn it down to as loud, how loud, as loud as the people that are there to hear it can hear it. That's all the louder it has to be. And someone was saying after Monday evening, well, if people can't hear their, can't talk with who they're there with, they'll just drink more. That's the idea. All right, thank you, Ms. Uh, 
Wells. You're at three minutes, Mrs. Wells. Thank Could you. Can I just give on. one? Yeah, but I, we could wrap this up if you choose. Okay. Go ahead, Francis. Okay, we'll wrap it up. I just want to say that Sherry Wells is speaking. She keeps saying all the neighbors and everyone on Troy, whether we're people here from Troy that don't feel that way. So I don't know if council knows this or not, but there's a, probably more on Troy that are not bothered by it than are. So it's not, she's not speaking for the whole block. All right, thank you. I'd like to move this back to the city council table. Yes, sir, go ahead. Okay. I'm Dave Cottrell from 1610 Bowfield. I was watching this on TV, and of course, I wasn't at the meeting assessing a noise ordinance about yesterday, one, because I didn't know about it, two, because I have other things to do, but I decided I needed to come here now. This is just, like, I was calling like a few Fridays ago after, okay, to the police, to Chuck, the noise on Rosie's O'Grady's, and I was at Plan of on a Nine Mile, and I could hear the music loud and clear. I mean, it, and I called the police, said, oh, they had already checked it, it's, it doesn't, it's not too loud. If it was, I was on a residence, I wouldn't, I'd be calling on a block. I would be calling on neighbors who were that loud. It's, it's right next to a residence. It is too loud. And a lot of this, all of this, a lot of what I've heard is about how it will lower our taxes by having all these bars and all the income here. Well, what you're trading is from a good, quiet city where people want to live and raise their families to now loud, noisy one where people don't really want to live or not live next to downtown. So you're destroying the neighborhoods near downtown and just give, and to build it up more and more until people don't want to live here. It's too noisy. Rosie O'Grady says the outside bar, it's too noisy. The changes should have been recognized a long time ago before Rosie O'Grady came in here. This is way too loud and it's destroying neighborhoods. Thank you. All right, well, we're moving this back to the table. Any final comments? Now, again, the motion is to uh, table this with direction to staff to come back in about uh, five weeks with uh, expertise and any possible changes, amendments to that or to the noise ordinance or to any issues in general. Anyone from the table wish to say any last things? Well, none of us are noise experts. Um, we've all certainly learned a lot. Several residents and business owners in particular have done a lot of homework on this. And in order to find an equitable solution, there are two sides to every story. Um, there needs to be some action taken, but it certainly needs to be as balanced as possible. Um, we, need to, we, we need an expert opinion. I mean, it. I know that it frustrates some people that we, you know, may hire people for their outside opinion, but we don't have this knowledge base in house. And to know that we're getting information from someone um, who has worked with other businesses, worked with other municipalities, and also worked professionally um, with in industrial settings, um, dealing with noise of this type and insulation, um, would just help me make a better decision. So I'll support Scott's amendment. Or Appreciate Scott's that. Scott, any last well. I, mean, I think the reason we need more information here, Mayor, is that um, it, it's very clear to me that the 65 decibel measurement here is not the problem. That something else is going on um, that's causing um, the concern raised by these neighbors. Uh, when we, when the ordinance committee committee met, and it was uh, City Attorney Dan Christ, myself, and the police chief, uh, we had a decibel meter in there with. Um, just the A rating, not the C rating, uh, and it was nearly 60, 65 decibels. But I don't think anybody would claim that that noise was keeping them awake at night or, or preventing them from doing. So it seems to me that there's something else going on uh, and that, uh, you know, people should be able to sleep in their house. But it also seems to me that there's got to be a middle line, perhaps something as simple as, and again, I'm not an expert, I'm not advocating that this is the solution, but perhaps something as simple as redirecting, the, you know, where the speakers are pointed, uh, planting bushes, uh, you know, when they have the speakers in the evening, uh, putting up sound absorbing foam. Like, yeah, I don't know what the solution is, but it seems to me that there might be a simple um, uh, cost effective way to do it that allows the businesses to succeed and, uh, you know, bring some um, 
change to the neighborhood. So we'll get some more information. We'll make a decision. I think that will be in the best interest of the city. All right. I'd like to share a couple quick thoughts, and then we'll take a vote. Two, two things. Um, one is that, and I've said this before, and I've done it two more times, but at least six times this summer I have ridden my bicycle over to the corner of Troy and Allen Street anywhere from 11 p.m. up until 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, honestly trying to find out what it's really like. And I've done it on Monday nights. I've done it on Saturday nights. I've done it on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Not that I go out every night. but. <laughs> I, and I did it last Monday as well. And the reason I did it last Monday night around 1230 is because it was said at the podium by a couple of neighbors that they never get a break, that it's, they never get quiet. And I went over there and for about the sixth time in a row, parked my bike and it was silent. It was absolutely silent. You could hear the crickets. You could hear a, a car go by. Um, and so... I know that there's exaggeration that goes on, and I, I, that upsets me because um, we all we live in a city, and we all have pet peeves. Mine is the honking of horns when the alarm goes off. Um, but it's part of living with the city, and if I chose to, I suppose I could move to wherever Brian said he bought a home in the sub some division. But I'd probably have to kill myself if I did that. <laughs> um, but I guess I just want to say that that we create our own environment, and I do have great sympathy for folks who who believe that they are you know, being inundated with sound. If you sit quietly and you, and you focus on stuff, you are going to hear all kinds of stuff. But um, we have to be masters of our own destiny. I've had trouble sleeping in my life, and there are things you can do. There are a myriad things you can do, from transcendental meditation to getting counseling to getting medication to getting earplugs to getting a white uh, noise machine. Um, but we do live in a city. We all share this. Most of us at this table have spent a decade trying to make this a fun, cool, vibrant city, and to put a stop to that, especially with that petition that could go into the ballot, would be absolutely disastrous. I know it would fail. And so I appreciate people coming tonight. I think there are simple solutions to this, but it doesn't always mean changing uh, what everybody else is having to do. Um, I am woken up sometimes in the morning um, by people cutting their grass or sawing down a tree. And I don't tell people to stop cutting their grass. I try to go back to sleep or I get up and take a nap later in the day. You know, you, you have to live in this uh, life and try to deal with it. Um, Madam Clerk, no other discussion. Let's take a roll call vote. Council Members Galloway? Yes. Baker? Yes. Mayor Covey? Yes, it passes. Thank you and thank you all for attending tonight. We'll move on. We'll take a moment uh, break if it's all right with council. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks. Jackie, do you want me to drop that on your porch? I don't think they're on the website yet, but it's Wednesday nights at um, 6.30 at the community center. There's already been two meetings. Can you get Brian to come in here and sign the, these well, agreements? I, uh, I've been trying to get you guys to come in and sign. Yeah, it's posted here at City Hall like every other meeting, but I will make a point to mention it tonight. I think his is the only signature on it. Uh, I'm looking. Yeah, well, if you, 
you can always call the clerk's office as, as well. Yeah, just just Brian. When, when, thanks. When was that? Long time ago, right here in the hallway. Oh. I can get that on the web tomorrow. Um, You know what? I told Krista that uh, Krista Johnson. Did that. You know, they put on a fair like that. Everybody comes out, they're happy. Yeah. And you know, I don't get to see any of that in these kind of things. Uh, so, so you gotta go out there. Yeah. Like, okay. I'm, I'm scanning through the minutes. Yeah, come on in. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and try, I have heard both of you numerous messages and you're ignoring me. <laughs> Look, if you want to be the landscaping, you want to sign these. <laughs> that was a tough one. Are you going to add? What are we signing? This is the agreement. Uh, really I'm I'm like I'm oh. I feel like I'm cursed now. Like okay. You never got my message. I got an email about your phone yeah. number. Yeah. I moved back to the I got my message. I got my message. I got my message. I saw I missed a call from you while I was on the phone. I love the message. I'll post it. I got the question of the restaurant. Like what they have with humans? No, no. Yeah. It takes it out of the sound. You look at it differently. I'm on the Stairmaster every day at LA Fitness. 610 pounds. All of a sudden you eat the candy bar. Big Mac. It's a 600 pounds. I'm going, Brian. Right. Or drink. I'm sorry. Should I even ask you? Is this the new sound order? Yeah. 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 Oh, what am I signing? This is the agreement for your landscaping that was approved in August. So I've been trying to get you to come in and sign it. This has nothing to do with that Print. <laughs> What was unsaid was what that we in fact done the petition like I didn't know why I go down there. I just didn't want to have a phone call. Yeah. Because they were good. The only one. Or was that 27? You know, it's kind of scary. I never even read this. No worries. Oh, that's it's August 23rd, Brian. Did I get it? I didn't even know. I've been in the rest of this since that magazine. I've been signing this. Thank you. You're welcome. See you. Hey, everybody. Good to see you. Good to hear. I need an escort to my car. <laughs> yeah, hang out down here in the safe room. See you now. She had my whole phone and she just got nuts. No problem. We with a sound expert. We're taking a break. We're not even, are you? We some other things. And I talked about, you know. Oh, so I do not have a press release yet, so. We'll go to say they'll finance your 30, but we'll put a 15 foot wall up here. Great, so my I'm going to Brian. My wall, Rosie, is supposed to be 10 foot. The mics are still on, which is FYI. Just letting you know. Some lights I'll pay your calls and put the wall back up. Okay, I'm the one who asks something. I just don't want to spend money on that wall. I'm the one that has something swears at them. And all they want to do is cut me. I'm going to get up more. I'm going to get up I'm going to get up more. 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 Thank you for yeah. thank you for being supportive of, of cabling and, and getting let's get the very best that's why we gotta get you know there's a idea of one of the changes that I'll lift to three of us is not enough. This, this three is why I do want to <laughs> so if you have something on your hands, you have something on your when you get older, and especially 300 watts, that's commercial. That would direct them to a 12 grand. And I said, Mark, that off. All right, we're going to reconvene this meeting in a moment. If I can get. See it. See it. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys.
had to get that last thing in about medication or counseling because that's really what's going on. That was, that's something to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's 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 nothing awesome. to do with All right, if uh, with permission of the folks at the table, we will, we are reconvening the meeting and I appreciate the folks allowing us to take a break when there's only three council members, it makes it very difficult because we are required to have three as a quorum to conduct business and so, um, and I do uh, send my greetings. I know that Councilwoman Piano is watching tonight. She's been texting. She's been texting you. That's good. I, she's very. Uh, she's not feeling well at all. But I asked her to watch the meeting um, from her sick bed. And so, hello, she Councilwoman. Hello. <laughs> if we're back on, and we are, Madam Clerk, what's next on the agenda? Regular agenda item B: consideration to opt out of administering the May school board elections for the school district of the city of Hazel Park and Ferndale Public Schools. Thank you, ma'am. Would you mind uh, introducing that item? Not at all, Your Honor. This is uh, an issue we've been talking about quite a bit this year. Um, the Election Consolidation Act requires Michigan counties to serve as election coordinators for all school elections. Um, each local municipality has the option to opt in or opt out of aiding the county in that administration. Ferndale has chosen to opt in and administer the elections every year since the act went into effect in 2005. We're currently in an opt-in agreement period that expires at the end of this calendar year. Um, initially, when the Election Consolidation Act went into effect, the majority of school districts in Oakland County selected May as their uh, school board election date. But starting in 2006, as local school districts began seeing the um, wisdom in switching their elections to piggyback with local, state, or federal elections, which for the schools, um, gives them a free election as opposed to having a standalone election for which they have to pay. Many school districts started switching their elections. Um, currently, there are only two school districts left in Oakland County who are holding standalone May elections, and those districts are Hazel Park and Ferndale. Um, there are some charges of the cost of administering an election that we can charge back to the schools, and we do bill them every year for their elections. But the act does not allow us to bill for what you might call soft cost. We cannot bill for our regular, um, for the time spent during our regular work day. And we cannot, um, of course my time, the deputy's time is not reimbursable at all because it's not hourly. And this is, <laughs> administering an election is a six weeks build up process. So the city of Ferndale is losing time and resources um, from us focusing on city business to us administering school elections. The city council has twice asked Ferndale Public Schools to consider moving their election to the odd year November. Um, and in addition, the Oakland County Director of Elections, Joe Rosell, and the clerks from the communities which currently administer the Hazel Park and Ferndale School Board elections We've all met with both districts to request that they move their elections. To date, neither school district has chosen to do so. There has been some talk that Hazel Park may be calling a public hearing next month to discuss the possibility of moving their election. There has been some talk that um, Ferndale Pub the Ferndale School District, which referred the issue to their policy committee, may be hearing a recommendation from their policy committee in October. I have heard nothing, I've been able to get no confirmation from either district that they will actually be taking action to move their elections. Mm -hmm. Hazel Park has already, their council has already voted to opt out of the school elections administration process. Oak Park, Royal Oak Township and Pleasant Ridge all intend to do the same thing. It's my recommendation that the city of Ferndale exercise its right to opt out beginning January 2011. Well, thank you for that introduction. It was very well done, and we have mentioned this at the table several times. And indeed, uh, for two years, I know the city council, when we've met with the school board, has had this item on our agenda, um, and it again is to save a fairly large amount of money, time, and effort. Would it be fair to say, Madam Clerk, in requesting information, that uh, years ago, when times were were better and and we had lots more funding, that 
we had the luxury of holding multiple elections through the year, but perhaps as we've moved into this new new time and new way of doing things and where all departments have to reduce their costs and where we have to become far more efficient with scarcer tax dollars that that's no longer a luxury that we can afford? I would absolutely say that the economy is driving this issue. Questions from the uh, table for information? Um, through the chair, I would, wasn't able to attend that school board meeting mm -hmm. uh, where that was presented, but um, what is the school board's position? I mean, the only explanation I've heard from the school board is that they're concerned that the school board election would get somehow lost on a larger ballot. Do they have another concern beyond that uh, that, that they've expressed? That is the concern I have heard most often. Um, they're concerned that the school board election will get pulled into partisan politics. Both those issues are not an issue if they choose the odd year November election, which is a local nonpartisan election with three offices on the ballot, mayor, city council, library board. So it's a small ballot. All three offices are nonpartisan. So that would answer those two concerns, which are the ones I've heard most often. Okay. Um. Um, Councilwoman Piana was at that meeting. I know that the mayor was as well. The other um, question that's come up from the school board's perspective, and clearly this is something they'll need to figure out, and um, I imagine they can consult other cities who've needed to make this transition as well, is that it would um, there might be some interruption in the, the structure of their terms. Um, some terms would be extended, um, but it, again, no terms would be reduced. Um, I know that our city clerk um, has presented some options, and the other cities have made this change as well. So. I would, I would hope that the Ferndale schools would opt to, to save money um, and streamline this process for a greater voter turnout at school board elections. I suspect. Well, I don't want to share opinions, but uh, there's right, going to be. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's all right. There will be pressure. I suspect um, from residents. You know, it's their choice. They are an independent body. That's correct. But the library board, which has been functioning now for four or five years, uh, I've not heard any complaints or any issues that somehow library board seats or elections have been impacted by, and they're on off years, but the city council elections and the library elections are viewed very differently and probably helps their turnout, which of course, in my opinion, is a part of democracy. Uh, one of the things the school board mentioned was that they, they thought that by having it alone in May, that they get really the dedicated people who really care about the schools, and I would suggest that all of our goal is always, all of our goals are always to increase turnout and that democracy requires the most people voting most of the time. So if there aren't any other questions or requests for information, is there a motion on this item? I would move that we direct the city clerk to notify Oakland County and the state of Michigan that the city of Ferndale will exercise its right to opt out of the administration of May school board elections for the school district of uh, the city of Hazel Park and for the Ferndale public schools. Support. Thank you, Councilman. A motion made by Galloway, seconded by Baker, and that would include notification of the school board. Did you say that? The, Thank you. I will add that, yes. Thank you. Discussion? Anyone? Mr. Zarafa? I would like to make just one comment about it since I live in the Ferndale School District. I was only um, in the last school board election which was, I think, uh, was, was it this past May or the May? It was. Right. I was only the fifth voter at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> and that wasn't just in my precinct, but I put at the Kennedy School, where two precincts uh, vote uh, for Ferndale schools. I was the fifth voter all day to enter that building at 4 in the afternoon that day. So, I mean, I totally agree. There needs to be another way to do school board elections and to tag them on to what you just uh, spoke about to a greater election. Thank you, Mr. Zarafa. Yeah, I think that turnout, that particular, it was low. It was three or well, three and four percent. We've actually studied the numbers and um, the results in a, a typical school board election. The turnout will be much more evenly distributed throughout all the precincts. Um, it won't be skewed one way or the other. Um, I think more say, get more people involved in the schools and, and excited about what all the great things that are going on there. And uh, that can only help. In Royal Oak Township and in Oak Park as opposed to perhaps 
other precincts where the voters are a little higher. So there is more democracy going on there. Yes, ma'am. This is something that our city clerk has been, um, you know, asking us to help lobby for uh, for as long as I've been on the council. Um, I, you know, I wish we could have had a, a clearer meeting of the minds, um, but I think that this will will work out, work itself out. All right, Madam Clerk, let's have a roll call vote on this issue then. Council members Baker. Yes. Galloway. Yes. Mayor Covey. Yes, that passes unanimously. Next item, Madam Clerk. Next is regular agenda item C, consideration of purchase of IT infrastructure upgrades. Is that from you, Ms. Talman? It certainly is, Your Honor. Um, on May 24th, Council approved a consulting services agreement with Highway T to provide a tech assessment and recommendations for the city. The City Hall Reorganization Team has reviewed the report provided by Highway T. We find it to be comprehensive and cost conscious. Um, just to briefly summarize the report, Highway T finds that the City Hall is currently divided into several different local area networks which do not communicate with each other. The servers in each department are either not being fully utilized or are aging and out of warranty. They feel that in order to leverage technology and establish an environment for collaboration, a single local area network should be created with a single router, a single file server, and all wiring running from a centralized wiring closet to staff desktops. Um, some staff PCs need to be replaced in order to meet recommended specs for the city's new financial software. Others are eight to nine years old and are running out of date applications. Security needs to be improved with a single centrally managed enterprise antivirus anti-spyware application and domain access via unique usernames and secure passwords. Um, a central point of backup for all data is an immediate priority, which means basically our security is weak. <laughs> We cannot communicate with each other, and um, we are not all backing up our data on a regular basis. The approximate hardware cost for the proposed upgrades is slightly over $20,000. Um, it's itemized in Appendix C of the attached report. And in addition, as we've all experienced this year, the problems with our current email system being hosted by Oakland County, we have a very low um, level of memory with them. So at one time this year, the whole system crashed. We couldn't communicate with each other at all. Um, Highway T is suggesting um, basically going into cloud computing by using uh, Google Apps to run our email and calendar functions. And that would be something that, again, we could collaborate on, which currently we can't share calendars, um, we can't share appointments with each other. So the total cost of the solution um, would be approximately $24,344. That doesn't include shipping, handling, and installation. But I think that's a very cost-effective way of bringing the city to where it needs to be technologically. Well, thank you. Um, request for info. Yes, Councilwoman. Um, it's Unfortunate that our Google Apps expert, Councilman Kiana, <laughs> isn't here this evening. Um, so, hi, Melanie. I'll ask this question on your behalf. Just to clarify, Sherilyn, when you say that we would be going to a cloud computing system, you know, Google Apps, which is essentially something that um, any organization or small business or just group of individuals could access, um, there is an, an application that is tailored to cities and has a higher level of security or storage, correct? Yes. So this is, a, this is a, a, a premium version of Google Apps, if you will. That's correct. That, that, that keeps suited. our information secure, secure. and it um, will allow us to address our retention needs. And this email falls under the record retention responsibilities. And this would also uh, allow council members to have yes. our own city email addresses? Actually be on the city email system, yes. Um, would our would our city um, staff would our city staff um, still have um, Ferndale email addresses, or would that all change? Do we know? They don't oh, what the the addresses themselves? That is not a question I asked. The, the domain w would remain the same. It would not require us to um, uh, have new domain name. And then my last question: um, We do not have an IT staff person. Um, we had one person who did some IT work. He's retired. We have uh, several others who pinch hit and have various levels of, of knowledge. Um, what type of, of support um, is, is built into this or is that a separate expense that we would be incurring annually? 
I know that is something we discussed. That would end up being a separate expense, but that's currently an expense we pay every year. We use, and, and frankly, right now, each department chooses their own IT consultant. So we will go to one consultant, and I, we will get a better price, and everything will be a lot more consistent. Thank you. Great. Councilman Galloway, this has been something near and dear to your heart for a long time. Well, it's important that we get people talking to get each other and uh, making the city more efficient. That's a lot of what the ballot proposals are on the, uh, you know, uh, this November to make city government more efficient. And I think this is certainly a step uh, in the right direction. I'm shocked at how cheap this is. Um, I did the same thing for my law firm a few years ago and uh, with the sonic wall and the file server and, and it was about twelve, about half of this price for six people, mm -hmm. as opposed to um, for all the people we have. Um, one of the things, though, that concerned me was the um, the printing. Uh, they're recommending that we get one printer, uh, and I think it's HP thirty fifty or something. Mm -hmm. That's a higher output HP. Um, but my concern is that it, it also references something that we aren't getting in this, and that's um, a color copier. And I know that in the past, there's been a tendency to always go with what we've had or the same person we've had, and we haven't bid that out. I remember last time it sort of came up, and all of a sudden it was a surprise that we had a new copier up there, or at least that was my impression of it. Um, do we know when the uh, copy copier contract, which we lease, is up? Or we need to keep an eye on that, because I think otherwise it'll just, mm -hmm. it doesn't automatically renew, but it automatically renews. Okay. I'll make sure to look into that, Councilman. Okay. Good. Good question. Anything else? How about a motion? I then? would love to make a motion to approve the expenditure of approximately $24,344 plus shipping, handling, and installation for IT infrastructure upgrades and first year expenses for an email calendaring system to be charged to the Public Improvement Fund. Support. Thank you. Motion made and seconded. Baker and Galloway. I think this is very exciting and, and long awaited. I only wish that I could have gotten an email address, but it's all good. Uh, if there's no other further questions, Madam Clerk. Council Member Baker? Absolutely. Galloway? Yes. And Mayor Tubby? Yes, passes unanimously. Are we then to item uh, C, Madam Clerk? We are. Consent agenda item C, purchase of radar equipment. I'm going to suggest or ask if the police chief would introduce this item, uh, and I'll share with you why I pulled it, sir. No, no huge deal. Just had a question or comment. Police Chief Collins. Yes, Your Honor. This is a uh, request to make a purchase of uh, new radar units for the for the police cars. We saw this back in in uh, July when we wrote a grant or received a grant. Um, this was to replace the 10-year-old uh, radar units that are in the cars. There's enough money left over to almost buy a LiDAR unit, which is a handheld laser. Uh, we do own one of those now. We find it very effective. Um, so we wanted to get a second one. Thank you, sir. And so, again, the costs or the uh, funds for this are coming from a grant. Correct. A special grant. And it's replacing 10-year-old units. And are, these are what's used then for police to pull over speeders? Is that yes. the main... Um, the only question I had was a request that uh, since the quarter is ending, the first quarter of the fiscal year, ending uh, September 30th, if you could give us at your at the next council meeting uh, or the following council meeting, Chief, from the judge, uh, the court, the uh, number of speeding tickets that we've gotten this quarter versus, say, last quarter. Um, it's my understanding that ticket, uh, ticket writing may be way down, and I just want to check that and make sure that, uh, you know, we're getting great new equipment, and I just want to see that it is used. Because the, probably the most common complaint I get from folks in Ferndale is, is really not about noise. It's about people speeding on the streets, you know, on, on Woodland or on uh, even, even on um, Troy Street over by the police department. I have a lady that calls me and says people speed down uh, Troy and, and even on Breckenridge, my street, which is a dead end, people drive fast. So if that's something you wouldn't mind getting for us uh, from the court, the number of tickets in the last Maybe quarter. all moving infractions? You know, the wrong right, right. You and all At one time you said all speeding tickets. Do you want all moving violations yes, or all sir, speeding both. tickets? Yes, sir. Both, please. 
I mean, I think the court probably tracks that anyway, so as soon as that's available. So we track that. I appreciate it, sir. Any qu other questions about this item from the council? I would move to approve the purchase of eight Raptor RP-1 radar units at $1,237 each from Custom Signal, Inc., and one 2020 ultralight LRB laser speed detector device at $2,702 from Laser Technology, Inc., for a total cost of $12,598, $12,218 from the JAG grant, and the remaining balance of three hundred eighty dollars uh, from one zero one three zero one seven four zero general fund support. Thank you. A motion made, seconded, Baker Galloway. Uh, and again, I just I, I say this is great that we're getting the new equipment. Let's put it to use. Let's uh, get some speeders. Madam Clerk. Council members Baker. Yes. Galloway. Yes. Mayor Covey. Yes. Passage unanimously. What's next, Madam Clerk? I believe we are to liaison reports of any. And I have none uh, tonight. Uh, Mr. Bruner? Nothing tonight, Your Honor. Councilwoman Baker? No, not this evening. Scott? Nothing. No reports on any of those items. All right. Then are we to call to council? We are, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Byron Fotides, anything to share from the Department of Public Works tonight? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're beginning the fall leaf collection season, and uh, I want to alert the residents that the operation collecting leaves uh, that are raked out to the curb will, will begin, uh, I think, October 11th. It's a Monday, and will continue uh, through uh, a Wednesday, December 1st. Um, and then those who don't get their leaves out or still have leaves to, to uh, be taken away after December 1st can bag them up until uh, Friday, December 17th. Um, even though the program ends December 1st, that's no assurance that if you rake your leaves on November 30th, that we're going to pick them up on December 1st. That's just when the program ends. So in, in the past, we've, we've had to um, issue violations because the leaves have been raked out much later in the year. And it would be helpful if, if residents would not wait uh, and try and each week put the leaves out. So because as the season progresses, it gets colder, wetter, it takes us a little bit longer. Uh, we, in November, late, mid, late November, it usually takes us eight days to make a, a swing around the city. Uh, it's get, it gets delayed even further if, uh, if people wait and then we just get a, a lot of leaves all at once. So just each weekend, if you get a chance, just put them out there and we'll get them. But uh, we ask not that they rake before the 11th. We do, we've had some instances of people putting their leaves out the curb right now. Um, and we've had asked them to, you know, to remove it. So again, it, it starts on October 11th. All right. Appreciate it. Mid-October to mid-November is ideal. And, and Byron, if you would, I saw, I think you saw the notice, the gentleman that said there's some construction signs that need to be picked up that have blown over in the wind. Uh, no, that's been taken care of. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. So the voters or the, uh, the residents can help the city by getting those leaves raked between mid-October and mid-November. Uh, Fire Chief Kevin Sullivan, what would you like to uh, share with us tonight? Uh, Mayor, Council, uh, we recently had a fire on Thursday on uh, Westview and Royal Oak Township. Um, I'm bringing it up because uh, it was a 30-year-old veteran um, school teacher from the city of Ferndale, and she lost her whole home, and it was basically because they had a um, power strip uh, with a heavy gauge cord plugged into one of these lightweight cords you can get for a couple bucks at the grocery store, either brown or white, really to extend just a lamp, overheating it, and the fire moved so fast that even with her son and his friend home, they tried to fight it with a garden hose that it pretty much uh, destroyed the whole home. First floor fire damage with heavy heat and smoke, and the second floor was completely uh, heat smoke damage. I'd just like to remind everybody to uh, make sure you're using the right electrical cords and that the fuse boxes are rated to handle the things you have plugged in. They had an air conditioner, a TV, a VCR, and a DVD player into that strip pulling off of one little tiny cord, and uh, the air conditioner wasn't even on. So it generated a lot of heat, and it did a lot of damage. They lost a lot of things. Um, so, and smoke detectors, a lot of people, fires lately, have not had active smoke detectors in their homes. So I would ask that everyone do that when we uh, fall 
back or spring forward with a change of time. That's at least two times a year so that you get a battery in those because they are life safety devices. Chief, do you still provide free uh, smoke alarms? Yes, we still have the station? smoke alarm program and uh, it's almost like we have to go to a battery program now, but we're still giving smoke alarms. And that's any resident of Ferndale? Any, anybody that's a resident of Ferndale, Royal Oak Township, or Pleasant Ridge needs a smoke alarm, we will provide it in the union. Uh, guys have been installing them and uh, making sure they're put up correctly. Oh. Oh, Chief, um, how long does the smoke detector, does it have a useful life that you have to replace the smoke detector? I've about 10 years. 10 years. Um, some of them you might want to replace earlier, but uh, people got to remember, and I don't recommend children take part in this, but pushing the button only tests the battery. That you can buy a spray now that you can spray it or light something small and uh, generate some smoke and see if the ionizer picks up. There's two different kinds of uh, smoke detectors, and Fire Marshal Batten's well versed on it, but uh, he recommends that the brand you get have both technologies in there because one picks up different weights of smoke at different times and fires that move at different speeds. So uh, if you want to best protect yourself, we recommend one in every bedroom and one out in the hall outside of. And doors on bedrooms are not for privacy. They are for fire control. They shut the bedroom door. It prevents the fire and smoke from moving to the area you're sleeping in uh, should a fire break out. And hopefully the one outside the door would indicate you have a problem. Um, then... Um, my counterpart, Chief Collins, is always saying at staff meetings that, that I'm doom and gloom when I bring up these things. Um, at the end of last month on the 29th, we pulled a man out of a house fire also in Royal Oak Township. He was in critical condition. He was rushed to Beaumont Hospital. I'm glad to report that Fire Marshal Batten was notified today. He's been moved to a continual care facility to work on getting his uh, endotracheal tube out, and he should recover fully and be back to normal, although he lost everything in his house during that house fire too. But we managed to get him out, rush him to Beaumont, and then he was rushed down to uh, Detroit receiving, put in the burn unit and a bariatric unit, and uh, he has done well, 67 years old. So good news there. And, Chief, um, I saw Brian Batten at the MML conference down in Dearborn. He had uh, some exciting ideas about ways to coordinate better with the, uh, the business community and, and have the fire department be an asset towards business development. And, you know, that's exactly the kind of thing that we've really been thinking about. How can we leverage our great talent in the fire department uh, to help, you know, the city as a whole, uh, the business community as well? And yeah. uh, he had a lot of great ideas, and I really look forward to hearing more about those from and uh, thank you for your uh, your written comments, uh, your written report. Uh, very informative. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I'm on target. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Thanks, Chief. All right. Thank you. Chief Collins, anything else from the police tonight? Just so you know, that was a happy story from Chief Collins. <laughs> yeah, about as you. good as it gets. Burned in tracheal tubes. Happy right, but he's, right he's going to be okay. Lost everything. Uh, thank you this evening uh, for the uh, allowing us to purchase those uh, radar detectors. A, the only other thing that I have tonight is I would like to make an announcement that uh, Officer, our former traffic control officer, Stephen LaRoe, his retirement party will be on October 14th at 6, p 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the Royal Oak Elks. It's a $30 uh, ticket. It includes uh, dinner, hors d'oeuvres, open premium bar, and we would like to see as many people as we can. Uh, show up. It's a, it'll be a. Yeah, the, the mayor. Everybody. Everybody's invited, uh, as long as you pay. <laughs> We're kind of like on a budget here with, uh, with uh, two of them going at the same time. But we really, uh, Steve deserves a really good send off. Um, he coordinated the auxiliaries, and we'll have a lot of support there. But uh, we just want to get out to the public. He's touched a lot of people's lives uh, from all the years that he worked here. So we want to let everybody in the in the city know that uh, his. Uh, Honorarium will be on the 14th of October. Thank Thanks, you. Chief. Any questions for the police chief? Thank you, sir. Ms. Tallman, anything else from the clerk's office? Just a quick reminder that October 4th is the last day to register to vote. If you're not already registered, in order to be able to uh, vote in the November election, also. Um, we have AV ballots in our office ready to be distributed. If you need an absentee voter ballot for the November election, please call the clerk's office. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tomlin. Uh, Mr. Christ, anything else from the attorney's office? Uh, very briefly, Your Honor, I, I uh, was contacted by a county prosecutor 
uh, uh, Cooper uh, to uh, participate in a meeting with other municipal attorneys uh, tomorrow uh, regarding uh, medical marijuana issues and concerns that she has. Uh, I will uh, plan on bringing back uh, information from the county prosecutor and brief counsel at the next meeting. Um, do us a favor, Mr. Chris, because one of our local reporters told us that uh, that she mentioned sending a letter to the city of Ferndale about that issue, and yet none of us have seen that letter. Um, and well, maybe there was a misunderstanding, but we meetings we tomorrow told a letter. Maybe maybe it was a letter to us about sending our city attorney to the meeting. But we haven't seen any letter. That's why we don't know what that letter is about. And would she be seeking any feedback from us from the city attorneys, or is this a one-way conversation? Going? Well, I think there's going to be a dialogue between municipal uh, council and the county prosecutor with respect to what. Uh, the county is seeing and uh, how certain municipalities are handling the issue. So uh, I'll plan on briefing council after the meeting. Would you be planning on sharing with that those folks then our feelings and, and yes. the work that yeah, we've I done? Yes, I suspect she'll ask about it. Where we're going with it? Yeah. Share our, our positions? All right, thanks. It'd be nice if we could all work together on the same page. Mr. Bruner from the city manager's office, what do you want to share tonight? I uh, just want to remind folks that the financial planning committee the Financial Planning Committee is meeting on Wednesday nights at 6.30 at the Community Center. Um, they've had two meetings thus far. Uh, we'll be putting the information about the committee up on the, uh, the website. The, uh, there's some discussion of, of changing the location in the future, but at least uh, this week, next meeting is Wednesday, 6.30, Community Center. Uh, meetings are open to the public. public is encouraged uh, to attend. And I had a question about that. Um, at this point, you've had two meetings, and has that largely been informational, helping get the uh, board members up to speed as to the uh, revenue and expense situation with the city? Uh, yeah, so far, basically, at the first meeting, um, the committee members introduced themselves to each other, and uh, we had kind of an open um, uh, brainstorming session for folks to both request information and, and share ideas that I then used uh, to create a presentation that I gave <coughs> at the last meeting, um, which I called Budget Boot Camp, but it was a, a kind of a local government finance primer to get uh, all the, the committee members on the same page in terms of the city's finances. So um, now they're prepared to, to go forward and look um, and more specific issues related to the budget. Uh, this week, they'll be hearing from the police chief and the fire chief, which the police department and the fire department are the two largest uh, uh, budget, uh, two largest departments in terms of the budget. Um, so at that point, the, the committee has to decide what it wants to spend the rest of its short time focusing on in terms of reducing expenses or increasing revenues. So if someone, uh, perhaps missed one of the first meetings, most of the information that was shared in the first meetings has been presented to council previously, but is also up on the website. So while notice of the meeting may not have been on the website, uh, certainly all the information that was shared and discussed at those meetings, or, or most of it, has been up on the website and presented here at least one time and perhaps multiple yeah, times. Yeah, the, the presentation that I gave this last week uh, will be put on the, the website shortly. However, it includes nearly no new content. It was almost entirely um, content that already existed from existing budget presentations. Uh, but what I try to do is take an entire budget process worth of presentation, uh, you know, hundreds of slides, and, and get it down to what turned out, I think, to be 60 slides. So it's, it's still pretty lengthy. Well, my question to you, sir, is um, are those meetings, they're going well, but are you taking care not to overload the members and or keep the meetings within a reasonable amount of time, hour and a half? Um, well, the, the last meeting went quite a bit longer uh, because some of the discussion of the meeting, the, uh, the, the committee itself. But at this point, Bob Porter's the chairman, uh, Joel Petrie's the vice chair. So it, it's really up to them to set the agendas and, and manage the committee's time. I'm certainly there as a resource to, to answer their questions. I just encourage you and, and all of those who present just to, you know, to try to be succinct and, and uh, helpful, but also not over overly lengthy meetings that would burn them out sooner 
than they need to be <laughs> or should be. All right. Anything else? <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Uh, That's all tonight. Thanks. Uh, Scott, anything from? Uh, just a couple things. Uh, we got our new water meter and uh, electronic uh, radio device. Uh, I think the whole process took about 15 to 20 minutes, actually. So they were in and out very uh, easy. And um, when we were presented, uh, when the installer or the uh, contractor presented, they indicated that there was uh, ability to get online and see real-time data on your um, water usage rates. Uh, we didn't get any sort of brochure or, or instruction manual on that. What is the process for rolling that out? Uh, We're not there yet. That that's still part of the implementation that's going on. But once that portion of this, once all the new water meters are in and that portion of the system is implemented, we'll be um, publicizing that widely. Okay. And. Um, it, uh, it's been a little bit since the DIY now, but um, it got me looking through the, uh, the survey we did of uh, residents. And contrary to some of the concerns about um, uh, festivals and community events that are always raised, I think that is the number one driver of citizen satisfaction in the city of Ferndale. Far, far in excess of anything else. Um, so uh, as has been brought up tonight, certainly um, you know, there's boundaries that need to be uh, protected as far as residential, but uh, we don't want to do anything to uh, upset one of the really unique and good things going on in Ferndale. And finally, uh, this evening we spent uh, $25,000 for technology equipment in part to help uh, departments speak uh, to get one another through email, through joint calendars. Uh, this has been something that's been on uh, Council's agenda for probably a generation, maybe at least a decade, uh, this type of uh, coordinated um, handling of information. And uh, this evening, we took a big step towards that measure. Uh, we can take another big step toward that this fall uh, with a ballot uh, proposal to change our charter to further encourage people uh, within the departments to talk to one another. All this money we spent is no good if uh, the information isn't coordinated and if the departments choose not to use it to talk to one another, as has been the history throughout my 10 years here on council, nine, almost 10. Uh, so I uh, hope people take a serious look at that. Uh, I think uh, the ballot proposal would certainly make government more nimble and able to uh, come up with timely decisions and timely responses to issues as they come up. Uh, and that'll be decided by the voters this fall. Thank you. So that's the ballot initiative on the ballot in Ferndale on November 2nd. Does that have a number, Madam Clerk, like ballot issue A or number one, or is it just? <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's City of Ferndale ballot proposal for charter amendment. Charter amendment. It, it's clearly titled that it's the okay. Ferndale Charter Amendment. Well, thank and you. And it follows the two state ballot proposals. Good. Thanks, Councilman. I certainly agree with you on that issue. Um, okay. Did the city attorney? Yes, he went. He did. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> One of my favorite city events um, on the commission that I think I would most like to join when I get to join the commissions that I want to be on, not just all the commissions that I have to be on, um, Beautification Commission. Um, they held their perennial exchange um, this past Saturday morning. Um, I've volunteered at that event for several years, and um, we didn't have quite as, as good a, a turnout um, this year, which was unfortunate because there was a great speaker um, this year. Uh, Lillian Dean came and talked um, about um, the rain gardening, composting, and using um, natural uh, or native, I'm sorry, um, flowers um, in your landscaping. It was an, an excellent presentation. Um, I know that Peggy Snow had intended to mention it and to thank the volunteers um, uh, at the end of her presentation, so I told her that I would do it. So a thank you to the Beautification Commission and then to the other volunteers that helped as well. We had a lot of fun on Saturday morning. Um, there, we had a full house tonight. Um, you can't always see it on television, um, but there, you, I'm sure you could hear there were a lot of people in the room. And uh, you know, there are two sides to every story. And when you have a larger group of one side than another in any room, um, there is a tendency to um, to snicker or to heckle or to whisper. And I would just ask that people are respectful when other people are speaking. You may not agree, but just imagine if you are on the other side of that minority rather than the majority. Um, so just please, the next time you fill up our council chambers, listen politely. Um, I'm not saying don't clap. I'm not saying you know whatnot, but 
the snickering and the laughing was completely inappropriate tonight. Um, and had I had a gavel, I might have struck it. All right. Well, it may happen soon. Okay. Thank you. Um, Real quick, uh, and that was a neat perennial. It's my first time, and I liked it a lot. It's it's a great way to get some new flowers, and it's free. Yes, so it's I like free. free. Um, I didn't mention this at the during uh, we adopted on the consent agenda the uh, small amount of funds to pay for the Vincent Chin Memorial uh, plaque um, installation, and on that includes some language uh, identifying the issue here with Ferndale. Um, but I did want to let the people know that the Ferndale Community Foundation, of which a couple of us sit on that board, has uh, pledged to uh, donate $500 towards the cost of that plaque installation. So it will actually be less than what is on our agenda. And uh, I'll make sure that that happens. And I, I really look forward to that installation uh, and ceremony with members of the American uh, Chinese Society and the other organizations that deal with civil rights and Vincent Chin's uh, memorial to uh, to hold that event this year prior to the end of the of the year. I do want to report that uh, we've had a number of bicycles stolen. This is not uncommon, but I do recommend that since there are so many folks in Ferndale who like to ride bikes, that they always be very careful and lock their bikes. A number of bikes have been stolen, bicycles um, that were simply not locked up and that's an invitation for disaster. Um, but some of them have been stolen by folks cutting the cable, including one that I was nearby, and uh, folks actually saw the person uh, cutting the cable and just thought that perhaps it was his bike and he lost the key or something like that. And I just want to recommend that if folks see anybody um, with bolt cutters or uh, looking like they're cutting the cable on a bicycle, uh, it's always better to apologize uh, later uh, than to run the risk that that might be a thief. So lock your bike up. If you see something suspicious, call the police. That's what they're there for. Um, and finally, our city is going to have a visitor tomorrow, Brenda Lawrence, who is the mayor of Southfield, Michigan, is going to be touring our downtown tomorrow afternoon, beginning at 2 p.m. Uh, she and a group of her uh, friends and supporters, she's a candidate, by the way, for lieutenant governor on the uh, team of Verge Venero, uh, we'll be touring downtown from 2 p.m. until 3.30 p.m. I've been asked to escort her and, and I certainly agreed to help do that. So we're going to start at Rosie O'Grady's at 2 p.m. and then take her up and down West Nine Mile and perhaps over on Woodward Avenue and introduce her to some of the residents, some of the business owners. So if you haven't met Brenda Lawrence, she's a dyna dynamic woman and an excellent mayor, um, feel free to come find us on uh, Tuesday afternoon in downtown Ferndale. There being no other business tonight, this meeting is adjourned. So Starman Marvin sounds like quite the place, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you read this? It's like a Disney World strip clubs. Oh.